welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the sound of suspense. To the fear you can hear. I have an unusual story about a father and son. You know it is said that love and hate are two sides of the same coin. If this is so, Phil, the son, never believed it. His hatred blinded him to the extent that he lost all humanity and compassion for his father. This is Phil Coleman. It's not in the past. It's now. Every day of my life since I can remember. It was my mother's life. The life of my sister. It wasn't only his miserable life that was destroyed. It was all of us. My mother dead at 43. My sister, I don't even know where she is. Or what became of her. Now look, Mr. Coleman, I can appreciate what you've been through, but... If you won't take him, he'll die here in prison. Let him. Let him die. Our mystery drama, Accounts Receivable, was especially written for the Radio Mystery Theater by Sidney Sloan and stars William Prince. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Bill Coleman parked his battered pickup truck in the prison compound marked for visitors. He walked 50 yards to the dirty gray guardhouse and presented his credentials to the stony-faced officer who permitted Coleman to step out again into the rain and proceed toward the great dirty granite complex, the maximum security prison for the state. Once inside, Coleman was ushered into the office of the chief prison doctor. Uh, Mr. Coleman, will you have a chair? I just want to get out the file on your father. I'm sorry you had to come out on such a nasty day. Uh, let me see here, Coleman. Uh, uh, Richard. Uh, oh, here we are. I don't really need to look at the file on Rich Coleman. I almost know it by heart. Uh, caught in the police trap after being at large for 12 days after the payroll robbery at the Sphinx Tool and Dye Company plant. Both his accomplices, Buddy Mayer and Mickey Montrose, killed running from the police and their share of the robbery recovered. Only your father held out, denying that he had any part of the money. Please, Doctor. I know the story. Yeah, I suppose you do. Do you think he hid his share somewhere before the police got him? I don't know any more than you do. $106,000. Your father was quite a celebrity all over the papers, TV, radio... Nobody talked of anything else at the time. He was something of a folk hero. Gunman? Bank robber? A folk hero? Now, look, Mr. Coleman, uh, the reason I asked you to come is that I couldn't write what I wanted to say. I discussed the matter with the warden, and he approved of my plan. He will cooperate, and with his help, it won't be too difficult to obtain a parole. Parole? He's, he's coming out? He's had a serious heart attack. It's his third. Now, the parole can be arranged for humane reasons, etc. There's only one catch. The warden will go along with this if... if you will assume responsibility. No. He's a sick old man. No. What if you won't take him? He'll die here. Let him. Let him die. How long is it since you've seen him? I went to his trial. I took my mother. Over nine years ago. You haven't seen him or written to him since? Well, he wrote to me when he was informed that my mother died. I didn't answer. He sent birthday cards to Harry, my son. I want you to do something for me. I want you to see him. No. No, I, I couldn't. I want you to do it for me. I won't ask anything else of you. It won't take long, Mr. Coleman. Rick? Rick? Think yeah. you can wake up a bit and talk? 
Oh, it's you, Doc. What do you want? I brought someone to see you, Rick. Hello? Rick? Who is it? It's your son, Rick. He's come to see you. So? You? Yeah. Yeah, Rick. Uh, how, how are you feeling? I feel fine. I feel a little under the weather. I, uh, how's the kid? Oh, Harry's fine. He's uh, going to school. Fine. Nina, how's she? I only saw her that one time at the trial. Oh, she's she's okay. She's getting on. If so, I wonder if when you get back, would you send me a picture of Harry? Oh, yeah. I guess so. I'd appreciate that. Well, sure. Sure, I'll send you a picture. Well, well, only so, if you don't mind, I'd like to have my grandson send it. Bill, is that you? Yeah, Nina. Come on out in the kitchen. We're fixing dinner. Yeah, smells good. One of your favorites. I thought I'd make you feel better with a good meal in you after a day of driving in the rain. Is it still raining? Oh, it stopped about an hour ago. Just about when I got to Glen's Falls. That's good. We had enough rain. Oh, yeah. Harry home? Uh, yeah, in his room doing his homework. But was that radio going? <laughs> he says he concentrates better. Ames call? Yeah, twice. About 30 minutes ago. He uh, seemed angry. Uh, that's too damn bad. I wish you and him got along. It'd make it so much easier. But he never does his share of the work at this station. If he has to go out and bump a tank of gas, you'd think the world was coming to an end. Try to get his hands dirty. Well, now, you knew he didn't know anything about the gas station business, Phil. Okay, though. okay, I needed his money, but I can't carry him on my back. I gotta buy him out. Well, ain't you gonna ask me? I know you'll get around to it in your own time. I saw him. Talked to him. How is he? Hardly recognize him. Gotten so old. I don't think he knew me at first. He's been sick. Hard. Doc said it was his third, a bad one. That why they wanted you to come see him? Uh, uh, partly. They had something else up their sleeve. They're going to let him out. Out? Well, I thought he was... He was in for life. That's right. Four-time loser, they call it. According to the state laws, that's life. But because of his health, the doc called it uh, humane reasons or something. They'll parole him. And they have to get your approval, huh? That, that why they made you come? <laughs> Something like that. They want me to be responsible for him. What? They want me to take him in, take care of him. Well, maybe he wouldn't want that, Phil. He's got nothing to say about it. It's either that or die in prison. Oh, Phil. I told him. I told him. No. I wouldn't have him. Now, Phil... You know you're going to take him in. No, no, I'll never have him in my house. Let that jailbird die where he belongs. Let him die in prison. That is hot tip in the seventh. I Sketch. Uh, just a minute, Lou. Did you see I'm busy calling? Oh, anyway, so what happens? I plunge. I put 20 on his nose. Sketch, cut it short, will you? I want to talk to you. Lou, I'm sorry. I'll have to continue this later. Boy, have you got a nerve. Are your damn telephone call so important you can't wait on a customer? That punk, I know he was there. Give me two bucks worth. I'm trying to discourage customers like that. Looks like you're trying to discourage all of them. We're losing people every day to Ray Damon at the People's Corner. Good. Why don't you buy me out and go join up with your buddy Ray? You make me very happy. I can't talk to you anymore without getting into a fight. I want out, Coleman. I want it quick. Buy my half of the business and run things your own crooked way. Crooked? What are you saying? I'm wise to you, Coleman. I've known about you for the last three years. What? I should have known it four years ago. I could have avoided all this. Avoided what, Ames? Okay, buddy, if you want it cold and clear like a weather report, your father's a jailbird. Go on. Why should I go on? You get what I mean. No, I don't. I'd like to have you spell it out. All nice and slow. 
You know the old saying, like father, like... <coughs> You're the lowest scub I've ever known. To lay on me about what my father's done. I've never cheated you out of one lousy cent. I put up with you, split even with you for four years. You haven't done five cents worth of work. This does it. I want you to get up 15 grand by the end of the month and buy me out. I'm seeing Clark Wetley at the bank tomorrow morning. As for you, you don't have to come around here to use the phone in the men's room. You just stay home. I'll send you your cut. Now get out of my service station. Hello, Mr. Wetley. I, I want you to excuse me for calling you at home after business hours. Well, you see, I can't make it down to the bank during the day. I've been trying for over a week. I, uh, I'm kind of short-handed. Who, Ames? Oh, well, th that's why I'm calling you. I, I want to buy him out. You see, it's a good business for one owner, but when you divide it in two... What I'm trying to say is I'm, I'm going to need a, a big loan from the bank. Fifteen. Yeah, that, that's what he wants for his share. Well, he won't take less than that. Yeah, I, I, I know it's tough trying to do this over the phone. Maybe uh, tomorrow morning. Oh, thanks, thanks. I, I appreciate that. Well, how do you sound? Oh, I don't know. No, that's a lot I'm asking for. Till suppose you can't get the money. What can Ames do? Well, he called me on the phone at the station today. He says he's talking to his lawyer. And if I can't make it, he says he can force a sale of the property and a division of the proceeds. You know what that would amount to after we paid off the five grand loan to the bank and, and, and legal fees? Maybe five, six thousand each? Five thousand. Out of work. How long would it last? You know, I'm desperate. I, I, I never felt so boxed in in my life. I, I got only ten more days till the end of the month. Oh, darling, don't worry. We'll manage. I'll, I'll get that. Yes. Yes, this is the Coleman residence. Who's... Co well, yes, he's home, but who, I don't know... Who, who is it, Nina? Uh, pardon me a minute. Still, it, it's that doctor. The, the doctor from the prison? What do I need this for? At this time. I know what he wants, and he knows how I feel. Tell him to... No, give me that phone. Look, doctor, why can't you leave me alone? You know, I, I, I don't want him now or ever. That's final. Goodbye. I can remember wanting a father so much it had hurt. I'd cry at night in my bed and I'm quiet so my mother wouldn't hear. And I'd pray. Please, God, let me have him around for a week, huh? a whole day, an hour. That's when I really believed in a God. I swore that if I ever had a kid, I'd love him, take care of him. Clean and honest like his father. I've never taken a cent that didn't belong to me, Nina. I know that, dear, and I love you for it. You're a good man. That wasn't the first time the doctor has called, was it? No, he... He's called at least five times in the last few days. Call him. Tell him that the old man can come. Oh, Phil. I don't know how we're going to manage. And so Phil Coleman yields to the pressure around him to accept his father into his home. The barrier of hate he has built up, however, will not dissolve. We'll return shortly with Act Two. The first of the month has come, and Phil Coleman has not been able to raise the money to buy out his partner. Another event is taking place which brings him no joy. His father is coming today to become a permanent member of the household. Harry, Harry, take it easy. You know how excited you get about things. Now, remember, 
Brooks. He's an old man, and he's been very sick. I know, I know. Mom, I'm really glad to see him. Well, go open the door. Dad's carrying the suitcase. Welcome, Grandpa. Here, let me take this suitcase. Dad, I'll show him to his room. Well, come in. Don't just stand in the door. Sure, thanks. Let me take the suitcase. Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, here. Follow me, Grandpa. I'll show you where you bunk. Uh, Harry, take it easy. <laughs> Give him a chance to catch his breath. You, uh... You want to sit down, Rick? Okay to sit, Phil? Sure. Uh, if you want anything, coffee or tea or anything... I ain't allowed to drink coffee. Oh. Well, if you're tired... No, I ain't you, tired. you can go to bed. Don't sit up to be polite. I, I ain't tired. Oh, Nina, I'm, I'm going down to the station. I... Got a little work to do. Well, Eddie called up at 7 when he closed up, Bill. What's the point of going there at this hour? Well, today's the first of the month. I said I'd pay my bills. <laughs> Some people do, you know. Phil, your father just got here. Now, I got bills to pay, Nina. How about a game of checkers, Grandpa? Uh, homework, Harry? I did it this afternoon so I'd have a chance to spend some time with Grandpa. How about it, Grandpa? I'm going to show you how to play that game. I was a champ at it. Call my service station. Oh, Mr. Wetley. Uh, yeah, yeah, I called the bank earlier, but they said you was busy. Yeah. Well, it, it's getting kind of urgent. You see, I told Ames I'd be able to settle matters with him around the first of the month. It's the 11th already. He calls me every day. Mr. Wetley, I'm desperate. I gotta get that loan. What? Well, when can you let me know? Well, uh, couldn't you make it sooner? Okay, Mr. Wetley, I, I know you're doing your best for me. Uh, pardon me, Mr. Wetley, someone wants gas. Uh, please call me as soon as you know. Thanks. Goodbye. Coming! Well, I'm sorry to keep you... It's the way you do business, Coleman? You're going to run this joint into the ground in three months. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, but Eddie's out to lunch. There's something, Skitch. Mr. Ames to you, Coleman. Fill her up. Sure, sure. reason I dropped by, Coleman, my lawyer's drawing up papers to dissolve our partnership and... Uh... Well, I was just talking to the bank when you drove in. Good. When are you getting the cash? Uh, soon. What does that mean? Either you're going to get it or you ain't. Don't try stalling me with soon. You said you'd have it before the end of last month. You know what the date is today? I'm doing my best. It ain't good enough. Now, you give me a little time. Now, you, you'll get your 15 grand. I'll give you another week. <laughs> Thanks, Ames. You know why I think you're going to be able to come up with the money? Your old man is living with you now. What the hell are you driving at? Everybody knows he's got over 100000 stashed away from that job he did about 10 years ago. You fat pig! I gotta pull you out of that car. Oh, my God, you're choking me! Okay. Now get out of here. Coach says I'm an athlete for basketball, Dad. All I need is practice. Yeah, 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 good. Nina, you know I got to get back and relieve Eddie for dinner if the meal ain't it's ready. It's all ready, Phil. It's all ready. Rick, food's on the table. Thought I'd join you for a grub. I don't want to cause no trouble. Sit down, Grandpa. I... Uh, there was a man here to see you today, Rick. See me? Mm-hmm. Can't imagine who'd be coming around to see me. Maybe some old fellow may. Phil. Guess maybe Phil's right. One of my old buddies. Yes, sir. What can I do for you? Now, Mr. Coleman. Yep. Sorry to bother you during business hours, but it seemed like the best time to talk to you alone. Oh, my God. Herbert McCauley, Crandler, Nepping. International Insurance. I'm an insurance detective. Let me explain. When a big job is pulled, maybe a hundred, two hundred grand, even bigger, the insurance companies have to fork over the money to the people who have insurance to cover such things. The money that isn't recovered, that is. You get me? Yeah. But uh, what you don't know is the insurance companies never give up. 
They'll follow a man right into his grave to get back the stolen cash. Take your father's case, for example. I don't want to go into it. I know all about it. It might be worth your while to talk to me. Ten percent of 106,000 bucks is a lot of green. 106,000 was your father's cut of the heist. And that's the amount still missing from the Sphinx Tool and Die Company hold up ten years ago. But on trial, he said he never got his share, that his buddies cheated him. Ah, bunk, the jury didn't believe him then, and I don't believe him now. He's got it, <laughs> but he'll never be able to spend a buck of it. We've been after him for ten years already, and that ain't nothing. We kept after a guy for twenty years and finally got the money back. Happened before I got in the company. Well, they caught the guy digging up a big glass bottle stuffed with moldy old bills. And <laughs> here's the laugh. The bills were the big old size printed before they changed over to the small ones. He couldn't have spent the money. <laughs> it was out of date. Yeah, I, uh, I, I'm a busy man, Mr. Uh... Yeah, Macaulay. I, uh, I was over to your house yesterday to talk to Rick, but I, I figured it'd be better talking to you. Oh, so that was you. Look, I, I, I'm shorthanded here. You're, you're keeping me... I from... guess you didn't hear what I said a moment ago. You could get 10% of 106 grand just for helping me get the money back from your father. Okay, now, what's the big mystery? Where's Harry? Didn't go to church last Sunday either. No big mystery, Phil. He's out with the boys practicing basketball. So you have to practice today? It's the only time the basketball field or court or whatever they call it is available. Mm, so the little stinker thought he was going to get away with it, did he? Oh, now, don't be too hard on him. He's a good boy, and he works very hard at his schoolwork. Oh, I know. I used to go AWOL Sundays whenever I could as, as a kid, play basketball. Used to make my mother sew him. <laughs> Once she came right out to the lot where I was playing and grabbed my ear and walked me free box like that to school. <laughs> <laughs> no, I ain't mad at him, but I had to make a little fuss to show him the comics. Okay, Nina. Now, now, don't make a big thing out of it, huh? I think he's home yet? Oh, he wouldn't be this early. Got your key? Well, the door isn't locked. Your father's home. Well, Harry, you're home. Hello, Mom. Hi, Dad. This is Mr. Kanaki. My gym teacher. Ah, uh, hello, well, Mr. Cohen. I'm uh, sorry to bother you, especially on a Sunday, but... Anything uh, wrong? Well, Mr. Coleman, let me tell you that I know Harry's a good boy and an excellent student. And nothing is going to be done to uh, to spoil his record. Well, what, what are you driving at, now, Mr. Now, don't lose your temper, Phil? Mr. Coleman. Uh, it's just that Harry and two other boys have been playing basketball in the school gymnasium on Sundays. Well, what's so bad about that? Well, they had to break into the school to use the gym. And now, although they're all 14 and wouldn't be prosecuted for criminal action at that age, breaking and entering is a serious matter. Breaking and entering. And when we found the locks Jimmy last week, we set a trap this Sunday. And what do you intend to do? Oh, well, frankly, we are not going to do anything. But we expect that the boy's parents will exert some sort of influence to keep this from recurring. You've, uh, you've talked to the other parents? Oh, yes, on the phone. Three boys, club busting into the school... You call and tell the parents of the other two kids about it on the phone. But Harry's folks get a personal interview. Why? Well, uh... <laughs> you see, this is uh, sort of difficult to explain, Mr. Coleman, but... Uh, yeah. maybe, maybe I can help Wait, you. Wait, Phil. Harry, you go to your room. No, no, he better stay right here. Sit down, Harry. Now, Mr. Kanaki, I'll tell you why you came here to talk to me. Personal-like. You know the name Coleman for a long time, don't you? Read about it in the papers? Well, uh, really, it was your son who revealed that Rick Coleman was his grandfather. He turned in a theme last week to his English teacher, Mrs. Margolis, which uh, <laughs> rather shocked her. He, uh, he used bad words? Oh, no, 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 that wasn't it. He, he, he seemed proud of the accomplishments of his grandfather, extolled his uh, talent, so to speak. Now, aren't you making a lot more out of this than is really there? Well, I... I told Mr. Gilchrist I didn't want to come here, but he insisted. It seems that he, um... Well, he wanted to know about your father, Mr. Coleman. We understand that he's living with you. You think he's been a bad influence? Oh, I'm trying not to make any judgments, Mr. Coleman, but I expect you will. And now I think I've said enough. 
Please excuse me for spoiling your day. Goodbye. Keep your nose clean there, Harry. Bye, Mr. Kanaki. Go to your room, Mary. Yes, Dad. I got a lot of homework anyway. Well, what are you going to do, Phil? I don't know. But I'm going to start out with him. With Rick. In Phil's mind, his father's influence was spreading like some evil disease. Now even young Harry was infected. But what he neglected to notice was the change in his own character. We'll be back shortly with Act Three. Despite Phil's resolve to speak to his father immediately, so many other matters converged on him that it was several days before he had time to get Rick alone for the soul-searching talk that he envisioned. Strangely enough, the conversation, when he finally got around to it, took an entirely different course. Come. Rick, you busy? <laughs> Doing what? I've been expecting you for the last couple of days. Harry said you wanted to talk to me. Yeah, yeah, but I've been busy. I, I've got lots of troubles. I'm only one, huh? Well, you want I should pack up and... What are you talking about? Only place I gotta go is back to stir. Now that the kid gets wrapped with a charge of breaking and entering. Figure this is it. Time for me to pack well, up. Well, why did you give him all the stuff on you? The story he wrote for his teacher about your life. He told me he was gonna write it. He asked me for help. I told him don't do it. It'll get get you in trouble. So he goes down to the library, and they let him see the old newspapers and microfilms. Oh, so that's how he got it. Ask him. No, no, I, I believe you. First time in your life, I felt. What? That you believe me. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Rick, you know uh, Macaulay, insurance detective? Him. That old troublemaker... First couple of years I was in stir, he was practically my only visitor. Yeah, well, he came to see me with uh, something on his mind. Don't tell me, I know. That old story, huh? That dough was supposed to be my cut. They want it. They, they're, they're willing to pay me to help them get it. He went off at your 10%, right? That's right. What'd you tell him? Listen, I gotta explain something to you. You told him you'd go along. You'd get the money, didn't you? Look, look, Rick. Y you'll never be able to spend it. I'm desperate for cash. I need 15000 to pay off my partner, to, to get him out of the business. I know. Harry gave me all the details. If, if he forces a sale to dissolve the partnership, I'm, I'm done for. We both won't get what the place is worth, and I'll be out of work. What can I do? Look, the bank is holding back on lending me fifteen, but I could, I could get five. Give me the money, Rick. Oh, boy. That's a laugh. <laughs> You've never done anything for me in my whole life. Now's your chance to pay me back for the kind of childhood and life I've had because of you. Hold on, hold on. I'd like to help you if I could, but I can't. Why not? Because you want to hog the whole 106000 for yourself? You think that? Yeah, Macaulay does too. I haven't got the money. You know where it is? No. I said at the trial I didn't get my cut. They cheated me. Yeah, they said you were lying then. I told the truth. You're lying now. Okay. Suppose I'm lying. I'm not giving up that money because there ain't no money. Yeah? Busy? Dad? Come on in. I didn't want to bother you, Harry, if you're doing your homework. I'm nearly finished. You want to talk to me? Yeah. Yeah, Mom's in the kitchen doing the dishes. Uh... I thought this would be the best time to talk to you alone. If it's about that trouble. You know the Sunday basketball business? Don't worry. I had a long talk with Mr. Gilchrist, and he's going to forget the whole matter. Also, in spite of the fact that Mrs. Margulis didn't like the subject matter of the theme, she gave me an A- minus for effort and research. Yeah, yeah, that's good. I won't make stupid mistakes like that again, Dad. You can bet on it. Yeah, yeah. Look, what about Rick? What do you mean? Well, where does he go when he goes out? He hardly ever goes out. 
He sits around in his room most of the time. I asked him about it. You know something? He's been locked up for so long in a jail cell that he isn't used to having any freedom. He told me he doesn't feel safe outside. How do you like that? But when he does go out, where does he go? Once a month. He has to report to his parole officer. The office is over on Dean Street. I walked over there with him once. He wanted my company. Well, any other time? I mean, uh, does he go out maybe when you're in school or nobody's home? You know, slip out, kind of secret-like? Why would he do that, Dad? Well, I'm just asking. You know, I'm responsible for him. I know. But you don't have to worry about Grandpa. He told me he doesn't want any more trouble in his life. He's a sick old man. Yeah, yeah. You're right. One thing. It bothered him when he sort of let it slip out one time when we were talking. It bothered me, too. What was that? About the money? What money? Oh! You mean the money they think is hidden? He doesn't have the money. He never had it. Yeah, yeah, that's what he told me. You don't believe him? Well, let's forget I ever brought it up, huh? <laughs> if Rick convinced you, that's all that counts. That's what I was trying to tell you. That bothers him. You and Mom... You both call him Rick. Yeah? He's your father. Couldn't you... What do you want me to call him? Daddy? No, not that way. But just once. Be nice to him. Make him feel like he belongs. <laughs> Rick never done anything in his life for me. <laughs> I can't. I can't. The bank says I got. I got to get. I got to get more collateral. Everyone knows he's got over a hundred thousand stashed away. I wouldn't touch that. I. I wouldn't touch. Ten percent of one hundred and six thousand. I'll keep my hands I wouldn't touch that dirty money. Take the money. All of it, Bill. It belongs to you. I stole it for you. One hundred and six thousand. Rick earned the money. Bill, wait Ten up. years. Nearly ten years. Bill, darling, money. you're having a bad it's dream. Mine. It's my money. Bill. It belongs to me. Darling, please, wake up. No. No. No, it's my money. All of it. Bill, open your eyes. You were no. having a bad dream. What? <clears throat> I could hardly wake you. Oh. Are you all right? Oh, yeah, yeah, I... I'm all right. Would you... Oh. Do you want a glass of water or something? No, no, no. No, I, I'm okay now. You were dreaming about that money, weren't you? You kept saying something about 106000 And then you said, it's mine, it belongs to me. Oh, that's just a dream, you know. Did you forget it? it... I'm getting up. Phil, it's one o'clock in the morning. You've only been asleep two no, I'm hours. I'm getting up. Mind if I switch on the light? No. I'm going out, Nina. Out? At this hour? When will you be back? Uh, later. I, I don't know. I don't want you to say anything to Harry about this. Or to anyone. Understand? No. But I won't say anything if you don't want me to. Well, I, I'd like to explain, but there's no time. Rick? Rick? Yeah. Wake up. Yeah? Who is... Who is me? Me. Rick. Get up. Mr. Martin. I'll turn the light on. What's going on? Get your clothes on, Rick. What time is it? It's the middle of the night. Get your clothes on. Yeah, sure, fellas. Sure, if you say so. <laughs> Come on, hurry up. Get dressed. Sure, sure. But I don't get it. Mm -hmm. But I do. What? What you owe me. Oh. Oh, you mean for room and board? Oh, sure. Look, Rick. I don't want to play games with you. I want the money that you hid away for ten years. You owe it to me, and I need it. <laughs> you really think I got it? You really think I got it? I will... Get up. Get up. 
Hey, don't you laugh at me. Don't you ever laugh at me. I was. It just struck me that you believe I got that loot stashed away someplace. Just like everybody else. That's right. And I want it. Now, you and me are going to go where that money is. Phil, tonight. I swear I ain't got it. I never had it. Please, I'm... Get out. Yeah, come on, come on, get out. I told you the truth, Phil. You never told the truth in your whole rotten life. But you're going to come clean with me now, Rick. We're going out tonight. And we're going to get that money. All of it. Phil, well, you're acting crazy. It's mine. That money. You owe it to me. It's kind of like what they call accounts receivable. It can't work, Phil. It can't work. Why not? Because there ain't no money. There never was. I never got any cut. Oh. Rick. Rick, you all right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just fine. Well? Okay. Okay. Let's go. You win. much farther. We went out nearly an hour. Keep going. It's near Plainfield. I'll tell you when. We're five miles past Plainfield. It's near here. I recognize it. I see it. Stop. Stop here. Okay. Now where? Here. See this here path? Up to the top of the hill. Yeah, wait till I get the shovels out. You feel all right? Sure, sure. Let's go. It's not easy climbing up ahead. Keep going. Yeah. Keep going. Here, this is it. Here, start digging. You sure this is the right place? Rick, you hear me? All right. You all right? I was asking you if you could have been mistaken about, about the spot. All right. The spot where you had the money. Oh, no mistake. No. Down over three feet now. Deeper. Okay. I'm getting pushed. Give me a shovel. I'll help. No, 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 no. I, I'm okay. Give me a shovel. Give me. Sure. I don't know why you want to. You're too weak to do much. Here. I want to know why I want to dig and why. So. Sorry for what I've done to you. Why, 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 why you want to dig? I didn't give you nothing in your whole life. I'm really sorry for what. I was rotten, Cleve. You know why I wanted to dig? No, no, why? Because I'm digging my own grave. <laughs> hey, Rick! Rick, what is it? Get me down. Get me down. <laughs> there ain't no money, Phil. Not a damn cent. No dough. I was telling the truth once in my life. Nobody believed me. Okay. I believe you. No, no take it easy. You, you're going to be okay. No. Never. No. Why did you want to go through with this whole digging business if you knew it wasn't there? I wanted to show you what wanting money can do even to an honest Joe like you. Now maybe you can understand the kind of mug your father was. Oh, <laughs> Rick. Rick, listen. Everything's going to be all right between us from now on. Sure. Sure. Only one thing. Yeah? Call me something besides Rick. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've been wanting to. I, I've been wanting to. That easy for me to say it. Pa? Pa? Get well. Don't die, Pa. Thanks, Phil. 
Thanks. Son. Pa! Phil Coleman searched for a father all his life and lost him at the moment of finding him. I'll be back shortly. The other side of the coin was revealed to Phil too late. But in his heart was a new understanding of his father, of his son, and the meaning of love. Our cast included William Prince, Joseph Julian, Ralph Carter, Joan Lovejoy, Robert Dryden, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. I said, who are you? Tell me. Spencer. What, what are you doing here? Now, look, darling, if this is a... Oh, no. Oh, oh, oh. What am I doing if here? If this is a joke, it's not in the best of taste. I'm afraid. I'm afraid I don't know where I am. Or, uh, or who you are. Where are you going? Home. This is your home, Spencer. Uh, please, uh, don't be alarmed, please. I, I hope I haven't frightened you. I'll, I'll leave this minute. You mean that after 23 years of marriage, you look at your wife one morning and you don't know who she is? This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time... Pleasant dreams. Welcome to the sound of suspense, to the fear you can hear. For the next 52 minutes, I'll be your companion on a journey to a place in the past. It used to be that only the mystics believed you could go back, relive your life. But didn't so eminent a scientist as Albert Einstein say that the past, the present, and the future are all intermingled somehow? Then why should we question a gentleman named Spencer Chadwick? who is asking a very vital question. Inspector, do you believe a person can do it again? Do what again? Go back. Where? To that point in his life where it went wrong. It turned sour and corrected. No. No, I don't believe it's possible. Well, I'm doing it, Inspector. I'm doing it. I'm changing it. I've gone back. Inspector... I've gone back. Our mystery drama, You Can Die Again, was especially written by Sam Dan and stars Richard Mulligan. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. evening, we are concerned with bright young men. That is, those who began as bright young men, like Spencer Chadwick. Bright young Spencer Chadwick married his boss's daughter, but that was 23 years ago. And today, young Spencer has arrived at comfortable middle age. This morning, he will pick up his phone 
and dial the private number of a highly placed friend. Chief Inspector Faraday's office, Sergeant Melrose speaking. Sergeant, this is Spencer Chadwick. Oh, good morning, Mr. Chadwick. Connect you right away. Spence, I hope you're not calling to cancel our golf date. No, no, Martin. I'm... I'm calling to tell you... I murdered my wife. I won't believe it, Spence. I can't believe it. Marty, look at her. She's dead. I see she's dead, but I won't believe you killed her. She's been stabbed, Inspector. Yes, Sergeant, yes. And that's the knife, Marty. Now, Spencer... You'll surely find my fingerprints on it. What's that bruise on your head? We had a fight. She hit me with the candlestick. Inspector, a glass door here leads to a terrace. It's been broken. Spence, an intruder, a thief. Did he slug you and kill Margaret? No. No, I killed Margaret. But that broken door. She tried to get away. I dragged her back into the room. Whose place is this? Mine. I didn't know you had an apartment downtown. I've been staying with a girl. Spence, you're talking to me, your closest friend, Marty Faraday. Excuse me, Inspector. Shall I start the routine? Yes, of course, Sergeant. Are you going to arrest me, Marty? I have to. I'm ready to go now. But I'm not ready to go. Look, I can't believe what you're telling me. I can't even believe you were cheating on Margaret. How can I believe you killed her? You've been a policeman for 25 years, Marty. Do you still have illusions, faith, ideals? If I do, it was because of people like you and Margaret. I'm sorry, Marty. Look, Spence, is, is this the way it happened? You were having an affair. Margaret found out about it. She came here, confronted you. One thing led to another, and you killed her. Now, is, is that the, the, the story? Yes, yes, yeah, that's it. Well, where's the girl? I suppose she's dead, too. You suppose? Yes. Yes, we can say she's dead. Well, how did she die? I killed her. What? When? Oh, a long, long time ago. A long time? Spence, you're not making any sense. How could you have killed her a long time ago if Margaret confronted the two of you here today? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Now, just arrest me and don't ask me any more questions. I have to ask, Spence. I can't accept what you're telling me. Now think, how could you have killed her a long time ago? Or, or did she kill me? Oh, Spence, please, tell me what happened. It doesn't matter. Look, I want to help you, Spence. I'm your friend. You, you, know that. you, you won't believe me. Try me. Just try me. It's even hard for me to believe it. But it's true. Spence, sit down, will you? Will you just sit down and try to pull things together? Tell me what happened. What happened? It started one morning. It was three months ago. I came downstairs. Margaret was at the breakfast table. Morning, darling. Coffee? Ah, uh, thanks. Yes. Uh, any any mail, Margaret? Nothing worth delaying breakfast. Card from my brother. Huh? Where is he now? He had to put in for repairs at Pago Pago. That's Pango Pango. Uh, when is he coming home? Oh, next year, maybe. Or the year after, when he gets bored or tired or needs money or decides to get a new girlfriend or another boat. And he's 38 years old. And he'll never get anywhere. Don't say that. It seems to me he goes everywhere. Oh, his life and yours, darling? A study in opposites. You were born poor and you wound up rich. He was born rich, wound up poor. Um, dinner tonight with the Satterfields. What for? What for? Oh, my God. <laughs> I practiced for almost five minutes before you came down, tossing off what I just said in an offhand, casual way. A dinner with the Satterfields. This is the coup of the century. A dinner party at the home of Senator Satterfield. Ask me how I did it. Why? Why do we want to have dinner with Senator Satterfield? Spence, you asked me to arrange for the invitation. I disagree completely with the man's principle. Oh, we understand all that, but you're the one who decided to give politics a whirl. When did I decide to do that? Well, <laughs> they say the sign of a really solid marriage is if the wife can accept jokes at breakfast. <laughs> Shall I remind you of that Chinese or Indian saying that you've been spouting lately? Hmm? A man spends his first 20 years living for himself, his next 20 living for his family, and his next 20 living for his country. It was you who decided... Dinner's at 7.30, black tie. So be home early, hmm? Ben? You're not listening. Darling. Why are you looking at me like that? Is, is there something wrong? Who... Who are you? What did you say? I... 
I said, who are you? Tell Spencer. me. Spencer. What, what are you doing here? Now, look, darling, if this is a... Oh, no. Oh, 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 what am I doing if here? If this is a joke, it's not in the best of taste. I'm afraid. I'm afraid I don't know where I am. Or, uh, or who you are. Do you know who you are? Yes, I, I, yes, I think I know who I am. I'm, I'm Spencer Chadwick. All right, now listen. Sit quietly for just a minute. I'm going to call Dr. Berger. Oh, uh, please, uh, please. I don't want to put no, you to any trouble. Don't get up, Spencer. Please, don't get... Ju- where are you going? Where- home. This is your home, Spencer. Uh, please, uh, don't be alarmed. Please, I, I hope I haven't frightened you. I'll, I'll leave this minute. <laughs> After 23 years of marriage, you look at your wife one morning and you don't know who she is? Yes, Martin. All right. You walked out of the house. Now, where did you go? I hailed a cab. Now, where to, pal? I don't know. Ah, it's all right. None of us knows where we're going. Just answer this, sir. Where do you want me to take you? Just drive. Okay, you're the doctor. What do you think, the Redskins got any kind of chance this year? All right, let's try politics. You think Satterfield's going to run again? Well, as my old man would have put it, you wasn't exactly vaccinated with a photograph needed. Driver, why are you headed north? Well, you said to drive. The Chadwick building is down on Jefferson Square. I distinctly told you, you to take... You distinctly told me nothing. What would I be doing in your cab at 9 o'clock in the morning if I didn't intend to go to my office? Yes, sir. <laughs> Good morning, Rose. Oh, good morning, Mr. Chadwick. Uh, there's a Dr. Berger sitting in your office. Dr. Berger? Yes, Dr. Berger. Come in here, Spence. I don't have all day. Well, come in and shut the door. May I remind you that this is my office? Fifteen minutes ago, I received a call from Margaret. Margaret? Is she all right? About you. Me? I thought it important enough for me to stop off here on my way downtown. Hold out your wrist. Wait, uh, why did Margaret call you? She told me about that little episode. What? What little episode? You don't remember saying certain things? Paul, please, what is this all about? Paul seems to be a little fast. What am I supposed to have said to Margaret? I, uh, want you to report to the hospital right now. You can't just walk into my office and tell me to report to the hospital. Who says I can't? But what's the matter with me? I don't know. That's why I'm putting you into the hospital. What did Margaret tell you? That you didn't know who she was. Well, <laughs> how could I not know who she was? Have you had moments when you didn't know people, or you didn't know where you were, or what you were doing there? Well, well certainly not. Now, level with me, Spencer. Listen, those things, they happen sometimes to everybody. How often do they happen to you? Well, the I... incident with Margaret, was it the only one? Well, Spencer, I'll see you at the hospital in 30 minutes. Well, you did it. You're here, Spence. Of course I'm here. I won't keep you an hour longer than necessary. Probably get you out by the end of the day. Paul, you do what's necessary. That's a good attitude. Most of you high-powered business types are so self-important. Don't don't... start to lecture me. I'm here. I agree I need some help. Now, Now, what's holding us up? I am. I'm talking to you, and I should be arranging for tests. Now, you just relax. Listen to some music, read, take a nap. (laughs) I'll see you. Hello? Spencer? Peggy? Is everything all right, Spence? Peggy. Peggy, where are you? I'm at the apartment. Where else would I be? Tell me, are you all right? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, I'm certainly... All right now. Oh, Peggy. Peggy. I almost lost you. How could you lose me? It could happen. How? Dr. Berger. Dr. Berger. He could he could make it happen. But not now. Not, not anymore. Do you know why? Why, Spence? You called me just in time. You warned me just in time. And I'm getting out of here this minute. Chadwick. Yes, Ruth. Uh, aren't you supposed to be at the hospital? 
I'm not supposed to be anywhere except in my office during the business day. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, uh, this Dr. Berger, he's been calling just about every five minutes. And your wife. Uh, Shall I get them for you? No, no. I left Dr. Berger a note saying I changed my mind about the necessity for what we were discussing. Now, tell him I have nothing to add. Oh, yes, sir. Oh, uh, call my wife and remind her we have a dinner date with Senator Satterfield. And no calls. No calls. I don't want to talk to anyone. Oh, uh, yes, sir. Except, except uh, a young lady. She'll call herself Peggy. Well, for 23 years, you hum the same tune. And then, suddenly, one morning, you hear the music of a different drummer. A drummer named Peggy. Or is she a piper named Peggy? Who will have to be paid? We shall return shortly with Act Two. And so we have Spencer Chadwick in complete command. Ready to take hold of his life and run it his own way. Starting with his wife. Spencer? Is that you? There's no problem, no problem. It's not even a quarter of seven. I can be dressed and ready to leave in 20 minutes. Spencer, there is a problem. You made Dr. Berger look like a fool today. He read my note. It explained everything. You made yourself look like a fool. You admitted to the hospital, and less than an hour later, you sneaked out. I did not sneak out. I got dressed, went to the desk, and said, I'm leaving, send me the bill. But, Spence, you're not well. I've never felt better. You should be in the hospital. Margaret, please stop running my life. What did you say just now, Spence? I'm sure you heard me. I wasn't aware that I was running your life. Spencer, would you be good enough to explain? Can you show me how? Uh, you did say this thing was black tie? Spencer, I, I'm entitled to an explanation of that remark. Margaret, if you can't understand what I'm saying, how can I explain it? Quite a man, this husband of yours, Miss Chadwick. Uh, some brandy? Yes, thank you, Senator. Uh, we need men like you in public life, Spence. Fellas with their heads screwed on straight. You know, I have an opportunity to recommend a man for a presidential advisory commission on... The... I, I don't think I'd be interested, Senator. I like your style, Chadwick. You play hard to get, but you do it convincingly. The public eats that up. No, no, Senator, it's not a pose. You see, sir, it seems to me that I've spent all my life working for other people. Serving others is the most richly rewarding profession a man can follow. Uh, that's if he happens to be a selfless person. But I never saw myself as a manufacturer of farm equipment. I wanted to study languages, the basic structures of human communication. An admirable calling. Margaret and I were going to leave for Tibet on our honeymoon, but my father-in-law became seriously ill. Somebody had to look after his affairs till he could get on his feet again. That was 23 years ago. He never did get back on his feet, and I never did get out of his office. But you transformed that little factory into the third largest enterprise... I know, Senator, I know, I know. I did it for my wife, my in-laws, my employees, the stockholders. But now, finally, at length and at last, I'm going into business for myself. What sort of business? The Spencer Chadwick business. The let's please and amuse and excite and develop and enhance Spencer Chadwick. Thank you for your offer, Senator. But there are many others who are more worthy, not to mention more willing. Spencer, when did you decide you were no longer interested in public service? Oh, it's been building for a while. We'll have to talk. Oh, about what? About what? I don't know if this is a pose or... Margaret, I'm sure I can explain. Now, let's drop in somewhere for a nightcap. No, let's get home. Now, do you remember what you said to me this morning? No. You insist you don't recall our little scene at breakfast? No, I'm, I'm very sorry. You looked at me this morning and you said, Who are you? You said it with sincerity and conviction. You meant it. Look, I... I don't... I may have been... You may have been what? I... Daydreaming. No. It was not daydreaming. It was... Wishful thinking. Oh, Margaret, what are you saying? Spencer, 
You're having an affair. Uh, what? Please don't deny it. But I'm, I'm, I'm not. It fits in with what Dr. Berger told me. Uh, about what? When you say to me, who are you? It means you no longer want to know me. You're trying to wish me out of your life. Oh, Margaret, Margaret, I can tell you... Now listen, Spencer, don't try to insult my intelligence or yours. And then, what just happened at Senator Satterfield's? What just happened? Well, suddenly you're no longer interested in public service. Why? If you heard me talking to him, you'd know that finally I want to do things for me. But he as much as offered you a post that you dreamed about. A sensitive post. And you could become an important man nationally. You've spoken about it a dozen Margaret, times. Margaret, Margaret, I no longer care about well, it. Well, of course not. Because you become controversial. Make enemies. And then they try to get something on you. And now that you're having an affair, you're vulnerable to scandal. But I am not having... Oh, don't lie to me. That just makes it worse. But you were lying to her, Spence. We know you are lying. We know about Peggy. Inspector. Yes, Sergeant. If you'll come into the bedroom, Inspector, I didn't want to move anything. All right. Now, sir, here are these pictures. Are these Peggy... Are they, Spence? Yes. Well, sir, if you look at the hairstyle, that went out 25 years ago. Hmm. I'm no expert, but these don't look like pictures that were taken recently. Now, the clothes in the closet, skirts, blouses, dresses, are these Peggy's? Are they, Spence? Yes. The styles are about 25 years old. Now, here's a label in a skirt. It's a Lydia Carter. She was a designer who was fashionable 30 years ago. Well, Spence, tell us. I can't. Why can't you? I don't think I know how. Never mind how it sounds. Just tell it. Martin, did you ever think you could somehow get a second chance? To do what? To live your life over. To answer your question, no. Did you ever think you could go back to a point in time when you made a decision which changed everything for you? Where you crossed your own particular Rubicon and, and if you could go back, start again, and do the thing you really wanted to do? To answer your question again, no. That's because you never regretted the course of your life. And you did? Are you trying to tell me that you did? Every day for 23 years. All right, Spence. Uh, I won't press you. No, no, Ma no, Marty, don't put that sympathetic tone in your voice as if... As if you think I'm some kind of nut. Look, you could plead insanity. Once again, Marty, Marty, I'm not crazy. Temporary insanity. Not for one minute. I asked you a question. Can you go back? Can you live your life over again? And I gave you my answer. No. But you can. You can do it. I did go back. Not for long. But I did go back. All right. All right, Spence. You did go back. And if I hadn't lost my head... If only I had, hadn't killed Margaret, I could have stayed. I could have started over. Peggy, hmm? want to go to a movie? No. I missed the news broadcast. Anything happening? They think a war just started. Oh, come on, Peggy. Come on. There aren't going to be any more wars. Everybody knows that. People may be crazy, but they're not insane. <laughs> Where? I think the man said Korea. Someplace like that. But maybe I didn't hear it right. Hey, if you don't want to go to the movies, what do you want to do? Sit home and just listen to you. Tell me about the trip you're planning. Well, first, uh, don't call it a trip. We may never come back. It may <laughs> take all our lives. Fine with me. And we may never find it. Great. What are we looking for? The origin of language. For instance, we say brother in English. German, Dutch, Scandinavian, so on, say a form of Bruder. Same basic word. Latin, Greek, Frater. The BR becomes FR. Russian, Obra. The differences are all in pronunciation. Okay. How did this one language spread so far and wide to cover so many different kinds of people? Arbeit. How? That's what I want to find out. And we will travel and study and research and one day, maybe... Maybe what? This Indo-European language, it's only one of 30 language families. At one time, was there one single language, the mother of all? Was there? I don't know. One day, I hope to find out. 
Uh, uh, you sure you wouldn't mind scrounging around Europe and Asia? Oh, I've been to Europe and Asia. Ah, but not with a backpack. <laughs> not with a sleeping bag. <laughs> I'm going to love it. Uh, now, one thing must be clearly understood. At no time, regardless of the bind we may find ourselves in, shall we ever, ever, under any circumstances, wire your father for money. <laughs> promise? I promise. <laughs> Hello, Margaret. Where have you been, Spencer? Oh, excuse me. I hope that doesn't sound shrewish. Well, no, no, it doesn't. Or as if I'm trying to run your life. Please, Margaret, cut it out. The reason I ask is because I had prepared dinner. I know. Didn't you get my message? Yes, I did. I got it at eight. Meanwhile, at seven, the Millers, the Brownsteins, and the Gladwells arrived. No, no, the Gladwells were here at 6.30. But what, Why? You had asked me to invite them to dinner. And these are your friends, Spencer. I'm sorry, Margaret. I'm, I'm sorry. Yes. Well, if they were people I like, I would have been humiliated. This way, I was merely embarrassed. Well, I got through the evening, somehow. Spencer, tell me. Who is she? Margaret, Margaret, believe me, there is no... I start with the premise that it's my fault. Somewhere I must have failed you. I've gone wrong. But I don't know where, and I don't know how. Tell me, Spence, tell me. Margaret, please, Margaret. Please, Margaret, what? Oh, Spencer, I've been happy. You've been happy. Our marriage, it's been the envy of so many of our friends. Oh, darling, has it been a lie? Have we been living a lie all these years? Do you want the answer? I demand an answer. The answer is yes, yes, it's been a lie. Who is she, Spence? Who is she? Who is she, Spencer? Who is Peggy? I won't tell you, Martin. I should say, who was Peggy? Inspector, do you remember some time ago you saw Mrs. Chadwick? It was on business, I remember. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, I do. It had to do with a burglary, Spence. A burglary in your house. Believe me, Margaret, this is no bother at all. You see, I felt if I called the local precinct, I'd have police traipsing all about the place. It just isn't worth it. Well, what happened? Well, it's silly, but... <laughs> well, you know us. We never throw anything out. It's a sound idea. The worthless junk of yesterday has suddenly become expensive antiques. It's mm -hmm. incredible. Yes, Margaret. All right, I'll be brief. <laughs> we have a storage space where we keep old things, clothes, knickknacks, you know, stuff that you say you'll throw out sometime. You never get around to it. You never do. And? Well... It's all been stolen. Stolen? It's missing. Well, it must have been stolen. I don't care about it, but it's just unnerving to consider that the house has been broken into. Mm. Well, send a list of the stuff to Sergeant Milrose. Huh? It's not important. But but I feel that since a crime has been committed, it, it should be reported. Did I do the right thing? Of course. Of course you did, Margaret. That list. I gave you that list, Sergeant. It's on my desk, sir. I'm sure most of the items in this closet were on it. Spencer, you were the burglar. Technically? Yes. She needed clothes, Marty. That girl, she's a fantasy. No, no, not Peggy. All right, look, for reasons that I may never understand, you feel you wasted your life. So you fantasized a way to go back, to start over. It was no fantasy. Sergeant Milrose. Hell, it wasn't. You were sorry you married Margaret, mm -hmm. which all by itself proves that you're insane, Spence. You created this Peggy, and you had to dress her in a period of 25 years ago. There is no Peggy. This whole thing happened in your mind. Yes, thank you, Lieutenant. Yes, Sergeant. Uh, sir, um, that was from the lab. They scraped some grass samples from a skirt in the closet, and it's been identified as Duke of Wentworth Fescue. All right. Uh, it's a new kind of seed, just been planted for the first time. When? Well, about a month ago, which means somebody wearing this skirt was sitting in the grass in Benton Park... Very recently. You figure if a man's been married for 23 years, he may have a tendency to fantasize a bit. But Spencer Chadwick has created more than an illusion. He has brought forth flesh and blood. Particularly blood. We'll be back shortly with Act Three. While Peggy was only an illusion, she was Spencer Chadwick's private affair. But a living Peggy, or even a dead Peggy, 
is a serious matter for Police Chief Inspector Faraday. Spence, make it easy for all of us. Tell me, who is Peggy? Or who was Peggy? We can find out, Spence. We can check with the neighbors, the janitor, circulate your picture in the neighborhood, ask people if they've seen you around with a girl. You'll never find her. Don't say that. It's virtually impossible for a person to disappear without a trace. I still say you'll never find her. Damn it, Spence, I can't get used to it. You and Margaret and then you and this Peggy. How could you live with both of them? Didn't things get rough at home? Yes. Well, what brought on the showdown? Well, after a while, we couldn't go anywhere without Margaret seeing her. She's been looking at you all afternoon. Oh, Margaret, Margaret, believe me. Why don't you invite her down here? She'll have a better view from our box. Oh, Margaret. No reason we shouldn't all behave in a civilized manner. Introduce her. Margaret, I never saw that girl before in my life. <laughs> Margaret, you're staring. No, not me. That girl's been staring at you all evening. Margaret, Margaret, believe me. Wherever we'd go, there'd be no peace. She always suspected somebody. Last week, it even happened when we were playing golf with you and Henrietta. You're up, Margaret. I'd use a three-wood on this hole, Margaret. All right. Oh, too bad. Well, you go up there and show me how, Marty. You rushed the shot. You lifted your head. I really don't care about golf. You made the date with Marty and Henrietta. Well, we simply can't drop out of circulation. Spencer. That girl in the foursome behind us. Margaret, Margaret, she's not the one. Spencer, where were you? I had a meeting. Oh, well, we progress. <laughs> Used to be you didn't know, you couldn't remember. And now at least you're courteous enough to lie to me. You've been drinking, Margaret? Yes, yes, that's true. I have been drinking. Margaret, it's not good for you. Oh, I don't know. Let's consider that. Drinking is not good for me. I, I won't fight that. However, what you are doing, that's good for me, hmm? Although I must say, you're treating me nicer these days. You started off by asking, who are you? As if you didn't know me, and now at least you don't ask. The phone rang today, and I answered it, and the line was dead. What's going to happen, Spence? I intend to go away with her. Well, finally, you've admitted it. You are having an affair. Yes. Who's the woman? Who? Yes, who? I'm not sure you'd want to know. I have a right to know. Well, then, perhaps you do. Who is she, Spencer? She's you. Me? Yes, Margaret. The girl is you. <laughs> what kind of... No, nonsense? no, 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 no. That's not quite right. She, she isn't you. Then what were you trying to say? She was you. She isn't Margaret Chadwick. She was Peggy Wainwright. Spencer, don't look at me like that. I'm scared. Do you want me to prove it to you? Come with me. Come with me right now. This is what Dr. Burbick was concerned about. Spence, it's no disgrace to have a breakdown. It's no shame to need psychiatric no, help. No, no. We're past all that, Margaret. Come with me. I want you to meet Peggy. Come with me. No, Spencer. You come with me. You come with me to Dr. Berger. You know, you know, Margaret, people like you have one answer. Whenever you're up against something you don't understand, you have one answer. Whenever you're faced with something that's beyond your experience, you have one answer. See a doctor. That solves everything. That takes care of everybody. And it never occurs to you that yours might just possibly be the wrong answer. Now, why are you so sure of yourself, Margaret? Why are you so sure that I'm the one who's wrong? Come with me, Margaret. I want you to meet Peggy. Or are you afraid? Does it look familiar, Margaret? Spence. This is 32 Benton Boulevard. It's our first address. I remember. Do you remember... The apartment number. Three. Three A. Oh, don't tell me it's still there. See for yourself. Spence. Oh, where did you... How did you... Our first day 
table. And this bronze candlestick, our very first wedding present from my brother. These clothes. My clothes. How did they get there? They're here because they're Peggy's clothes. Oh, look, Spence, the Lydia Carter skirt. Oh, you love me in that. Do you know that style's come back? I want to put it on. Do you remember what we used to do? We'd go for a walk. In the park. Dinner at Luigi's. We never had dinner at Luigi's. Oh, that's right. We couldn't afford it. And by the time we could, we weren't living here anymore. We stopped at the burger shop. What's tonight? Thursday. That means there's a free concert in the park. And then, free dancing. Oh, let's go, Spence. Let's do it all again. How much fun we had in those days. They were... They were great days, Peggy. Peggy? <laughs> I always liked Peggy better. Somewhere along the line, you stopped calling me Peggy. When exactly did you stop calling me Peggy? When you became Margaret. I always wondered about that. How did I become Margaret? Why? Take a look around. See, Peggy? All the bags, the trunk, we're packed for the trip. The trip? The trip to Tibet. Oh, oh, yes. We were all set to go. Yes. You remember? Yes. As a matter of fact, you were a little bit sick from the shots, remember? Remember? Yes. And then the telephone rang. Yes, yes. The phone rang. It was... It was... It, it, it was my mother. Yes, yes. It was your mother. I remember. Answer the phone. Go ahead. Go ahead. Answer it. You answered it that night. Hello? Yes. Y yes, mother? Oh, no. Yes. Oh, all right. All right. We'll go there. Right away. What is it, Peggy? My dad... He's had a stroke. How bad? Well, they don't know yet. Oh. Oh, Spence, I don't think we can... I mean, I... I can't leave Mother alone right now. No, we won't. Oh, Spence. I knew you'd understand. That's when you became Margaret. That's when you were no longer my wife, but your father's daughter. Take off the skirt. Leave it here. Go home. It belongs to Peggy. Spence, what's the matter with you? I'm Peggy. That night was the start of The it. start of what? The start of a campaign to mold me into the kind of man you had in mind. The man who would enjoy the kind of existence you always had and always wanted safe, comfortable, secure. All you were asked to do was to help my father, who was deathly ill. Who else could have done it? My brother? It was supposed to just be a temporary arrangement. But it suited you, Spence. It suited you. I started making the kind of money your folks never dreamed of. I built an empire. I never wanted it. You, you wanted it. You wanted it so badly you stopped being Peggy. You went somewhere else. You, you became lost. But not me. I'm, I'm, I'm not lost. I found my way back. And when I got there, I found Peggy again. Now, take off that scratch and give it back to Peggy. Spencer, I listen to you. Now you listen to me. I've been listening to you for 23 years. And now we've come to the end. The bags are packed, and it's not too late. We're leaving for Tibet. Peggy and me. Peggy? Peggy? Yes, Spencer, darling. Spence, get this straight. I'm Peggy. Don't listen to her, Spence. She was always out to destroy you. She almost did till you came back to me. I'm Peggy. The only Peggy you have. She's lying. She's trying to stop you. We are going to Tibet. That chance. You'll take that appointment from Satterfield. That refusal was just a ploy. You know it. He knows it. Shut up, Margaret. Shut her up, Spencer. Shut her up. I didn't destroy you. You destroyed me. You have to kill her, Spence. Go ahead. Live with this fantasy of yours, this Peggy who rewrites history. She's all yours. I want my skirt. 
take off that skirt. It's mine. It's all I want from you for 23 years of marriage. Don't get her out of here. She'll tell everybody about us. They'll put you away, Spence. Get away from that door. No. Spence, keep away from me. No. You, you won't get out that way. Spence, I warn you. I'll hit you with this. Now, no, you, you asked for it. You asked for it. Use a knife, Spence. Use a knife. <clears throat> Peggy? Peggy? Where are you? Peggy? You... You killed us both, Spence. Oh. Margaret. Oh. Margaret. Margaret. Chief Inspector Faraday's office, Milrose speaking. Sergeant, this is Spencer Chadwick. I... I just murdered my wife. Well, as they say, all of us are two people. One is the person we think we are, and the other is the person... We really are. And the secret of a long, happy life is to make sure the twain never meet. I'll be back shortly. This is WOR New York, your station for Mystery Theater. Well, the jury's still out. Oh, not on Spencer Chadwick. With him, it was open and shut. But on the basic idea, can you go back? Can you do it again? Well, to end on a non-controversial note, here is something everybody can do again. Tune in again for more suspense and excitement. Our cast included Richard Mulligan, Mandel Kramer, Marion Seldes, Bryna Rayburn, and Gil Mack. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. You know what I'm going to do, Laurie? I am going to turn this car right around and head back to the city. Oh, no, George. Please don't. What's that? We all fall You hear something like, like, like singing? Ring, a ring, a rose. Let me open the window. It's a pocket full. It's a woman. Oh, singing that old nursery rhyme. A two. We all fall down. So what's that snapping ring, sound? Ring, it sounds like a piece of leather. It sounds like a whip. George, what are you doing? I'm getting out. No, oh, don't leave me, George. I'm coming with you. Wait. Okay, but stay down. close to me. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time. Pleasant dreams. Marshall, 
Welcome to the sound of suspense, to the fear you can hear. Our tale is a blood-freezing story inspired by a nursery rhyme, a sweet, simple song. Ring a ring of roses, a pocket full of poses, a chew, a chew. We all fall down. It sounds young and innocent, doesn't it? But it is very old and very sinister. For the ring a ring of roses were the splotches that first appeared on the faces of those afflicted during the Black Plague. The pocketful of poses were the herbs that were carried, hopefully to ward off the fatal disease. The sneezing sounds, a chew, a chew were the sounds of the final spasms. And we all fall down was, well, you can guess. Our mystery drama, A Ring of Roses, was written especially for the Radio Mystery Theater by S.J. Wilson and stars Glynis O'Connor. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Science has brought most plagues under control, but not so those other epidemics of the past, those that plague us with their unseen, unknown, and unexpected terrors. And such is the tale of terror you are about to hear. Draw close to the guttering candle, for you will receive no warmth from a ring of roses. You know, George, I've heard about this place so often from Helena. I'm just dying to see her home. And I'm anxious to meet your friend Helena. Oh, I'm sure you'll like her. But will she like me? Taking her best friend away from her. <sighs> Come on, George. <laughs> you know you're irresistible. <laughs> Why do you think I'm going to marry you? Well, for one thing, my beautiful, exquisite, enormous pots of money... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, George, wait. Uh, Look. Lori, get your hands off the wheel. What do you think you're trying to do? But we passed it. It's the sign to the house. Back there. Now, Lori. Lori, I never want you to do that again. I'm not going to let missing a sign risk your getting hurt. You understand? I'm sorry. I shouldn't have grabbed the wheel that way. All right, forget it. But please, never again, ever... And that is supposed to be the sign? Helena warned that we might miss it. Well, why would anyone use a rose-colored stone in a brass oval with no name or any identification on it for a house sign? Well, their name is Roston. And Helena said that generations back when their family first moved to America, it was rose stone. And so they put up a rose stone. <laughs> well, if they want people to get that meaning from it, they either enjoy guessing games or, more likely, just want to keep themselves very, very private. Yes. Yes what? As you said, they, they are very private. Well, I got that impression before we got here. And I also have the feeling that they're not very friendly either. Oh, how can you say that? When Helena's mother especially invited us over because she personally wanted to give us our engagement gift. Yes, and that's pretty peculiar, too. How? How many parties, I mean showers, did your girlfriends give you? Four, right? No, three. The last one was a dinner. All right, and Helena was invited to every one, but she... I know, George. She didn't turn up for any of them. You know, Laurie, I've never seen you so wound up. What's spinning around in that pretty head of yours? Well, I, I don't know, but... Well... I am on edge. About what? I I guess about meeting Helena's mother. You see, she she's so strange. She seems so powerful and so terribly uncompromising. I was trying to change things for Helena, and, and then I let her down by becoming engaged to you. Well, now, don't tell me you weren't going to marry for poor Helena's sake. 
Well, at least not until she married first. We were going to share an apartment together in the city. You know what I'm going to do, Laurie? I am going to turn this car right around and head back to the city. This whole trip is more foolish than funny. Oh, no, George. Please don't. Hey, what's that? You hear something like, like, like singing? Let me open the window. It's a woman singing that old nursery rhyme. A two. We all fall down. But what's that snapping ring, sound? Ring, it sounds it's like a piece of leather. It sounds like a whip. George, what are you doing? I'm getting out. Something's happening here that I don't like. Don't, don't open the door. Please don't. We'll go back if you want to. I'll be right back. Keep the window shut and the door's locked. No, don't leave me, George. I'm coming with you. Wait. Okay, but stay close to me. Ring a ring of roses. Oh, it seems to be coming from behind those hedges. You know, it could be just kids playing games. If that voice is coming from a kid, he's using a bullhorn. Let's stop here. We might see through the hedge. Please be careful. Holy Toledo. Look at that. Let me see. That man. The old man with the beard. He's trying to catch the girl with his whip. Well, she's teasing him. She's making fun of him. If he lands that wagon whip on her, he'll split her face open. Look at their clothes, George. They're dressed like settlers. Back in the early 1800s. Yeah. You know, they could be rehearsing a play. If they are, he's lost his mind in his part. That man's going wild with that whip. But she's provoking him. Why doesn't she stop? Hey! Hey, you there! What are you two doing? George, you shouldn't have done that. And who is it who is ordering me and questioning me? I am. Over here. That's a terrible thing you're doing. Oh, George, please don't go in there. They know we're here. We must meet them. That's a dangerous whip you're using. That young woman can be killed by it. I see by your clothes you are a stranger. And I can also see that you are a kind human who wishes no harm to come to another. But this, this wench is my daughter. And what I am doing is the true way to gain the obedience of a child who will stray. But what in heaven could she have done to deserve being whipped? I did no harm to no person or to him. I have broken no law of God or man. Stump it! Hold your witch's tongue! Believe me, young woman, when I tell you that she has the demon in her, playing and wenching with the young master who owns this land. While I'm out here working at clearing their forest lands, she's up there in the great house with her enticements and tricks and enchantments. And if it has already come to this, that he has given her a gift for favors promised or already bestowed, The gift of a ring. An already cursed ring. He gave it to me fair and with the holy vow that he will marry me in the month of the next full moon. Marry you, Willie. You can have fair to read and write. You who are lower than his mother's kitchen scullion. You give me that ring. I won't. I swear by the name and the soul of my sainted mother that you will never get this ring. And until I do, though it mean your own death, you get the whip. Stop it! Oh. Don't! Why can't you be a little more reasonable? She may be telling you the truth. I am. I swear it on my dead mother's Bible, I am. Well, then, if you are, why don't you give him the ring and let your young man personally tell your father of his plan? No! No, he'll do no thing like that. He'll bury the ring in some secret spot and drag me away before the fall of night. For he doesn't want me to marry to no one but to stay with him and clean and cook and wash for the rest of his devil life. As you can see, she's beyond talking of matters with sense and decency. She's been taken up with her planning and scheming to get away from me for the purpose of harlot's gain. And she hardly of marrying me. I'll kill you. Uh, George! Uh, she has an uh, axe! Uh, an axe! Oh, She's going stop, to kill him! Stop! For God's sake, stop! Oh, oh George, I can't look! She's dead! She killed her own father! Oh. What? 
Where is she? What happened to her? There she is. She's running away. Hey! Hey, come back! Come back! You can't get away! It's you who will never get away. The ring will circle you. George! George, don't try to catch her. She's like the wind. I'll never get my hands on her. She's almost in the forest. Come back! Come back! We're not going to hurt you! It's you who are going to be hurt! She's, she's disappeared. Uh, even before she got to the forest. But, George, look what I found. It's the ring. She dropped the ring. Let me see it. You know what it's like? It's just like the road sign. Well, it, it's the same shape. The same color stone. It's smaller, but it is just like the road sign. Rose colors. George, George, we've got to get help. The police, yes, somewhere. But where? where? Well, of course, the house. We've got to get to Helena's house. <laughs> This ring so rosy, this ring so red, does it belong to the living or the dead? We'll return shortly with Act Two. Are you alone? I don't want to disturb your mother. My dear, you're not disturbing me in the slightest. This room has no secrets. Its acoustics are incredible. I'm Helena's mother. Hello, Mrs. Roston. We've just had a very, a very unusual experience. Laurie's pretty badly shaken by it. Yes, so I see. Helena, why don't you take Laurie to your room, let her refresh herself? Perhaps Mr. Williamson will tell me something more about what's happened? I think the police should be notified at once. The police? Here? Did you have an accident? Well, not exactly, but we happened to see something that can only be described as uh, gruesome, I guess. And the police should be notified. Mother, do you think... Helen, dearest, this is not the time for speculation. I shall be glad to have the deputy's office call. But can you give me some indication of what they're to be told? We don't like bothering our officers unnecessarily. They have enough to do as it is. But someone's just been murdered. Oh, no, not again. What? Now, Helena, restrain yourself, dearest. Laura, you say someone's been murdered. Who? Well, we don't know who he is, but he was trying to whip a young woman. And, Mr. Williamson, she took an axe and killed him. You know, how could you? I was praying that it wouldn't happen to you. Oh, Poor Lori. Now, why don't you young people make yourselves comfortable? A glass of sherry might calm you. But, Mother, you told me that it would never happen again. That thing... Helena, I said I had taken every precaution not to have it happen. But who am I to promise I will control the uncontrollable? Are you saying that this has happened before? Lori, maybe Mrs. Roston wants to explain. Oh, well, not really, but I feel I'm obliged to... However, it is difficult. How does one explain the inexplicable? I think they're ghosts. There are no ghosts, Helena. Dr. Medvick, the last scientist I consulted, said it was undoubtedly an instance of photoly sensory projection. Helena pooh-poohs it. But uh, has either of you ever heard of that discipline? Oh, vaguely... It once came up in a course on parapsychology that I had at school. No one has ever proved PSP, Mother. Well, they've never proved ESP either, but a lot of serious scientists work with it. But, but George, what does that photo whatever mean? <laughs> it's quite complicated. Photolysis is the means by which light can affect the arrangement of chlorophyll grains in leaves. Chlorophyll grains? Leaves? There's a man not more than a mile from here who's been murdered. Now, calm yourself, my child. There is no such man and no such daughter. This has happened before. I've seen it. Helena has. A very few close friends have. Unfortunately, you have too. Uh, Mr. Williamson, 
Do you think you'd still like to try an explanation of PSP? <laughs> well, it's spooky in a way. By that I mean the, the scientific explanation of it. You see, we're all supposed to give off certain light and heat waves. And what is it happens in the case of individuals who are emotionally stimulated, uh, let us say, people in love? Well, the theory has it that people in a very intense emotional state give off more highly concentrated waves. Well, I just don't understand what chlorophyll and, and leaves and, and light waves have to do with a man being murdered. You see, it's tied up with photosynthesis. And scientists aren't sure how that process really works. But with the unusual intensity of light, the cells of chlorophyll rearrange themselves and are forced to give off some of the excess carbohydrates in which there is an unusual amount of stored energy. I'm not following this at all. My dear, Helena speaks of you as having the patience of a saint. <laughs> so, if you'd like me to telephone the deputies, I suggest you give your fiancé a chance to finish. There isn't much more, Laurie. Just at the openings in the leaves, they're called stomates, tend to react like projectors. And through the magnification of additional oxygen are supposed to be able to relay an episode they once absorbed when they were in the receptive state, like, uh, well, like film. Are, are you talking about something, something like motion picture film? Yes, Laurie, but he means something like a projector with a memory. A memory of blood in this case. Well, it happens that chlorophyll is very much like hemoglobia, except that it contains magnesium instead of the iron found in blood. Are you saying that what we saw was a motion picture? Nothing more? Well, essentially, that's it. But when and where the original was recorded, we have no idea. Well, but there's a building. There's a cabin out there. And there's a man's body bleeding. Why don't you go and see for yourself if you don't believe us? No, Laurie, there's nothing there. Helena, you too? Yes, as Mother said, I've seen it. Others have too. Around here, they call it the Enchanted Forest. But if you go out there again, you won't find a cabin or a man. Nothing. The police know all about it. They'll come and you'll just feel foolish. I, I don't know what to think. It all seemed so real. Well, now, why don't we come back to the present and the truly real? Because I have the real pleasure of giving you our gift to celebrate your engagement. It's a complete surprise. Even I don't know what it is. Laurie, dear, it isn't that what we're giving you is expensive or valuable. But it is dear to us. We hope it will be your first family heirloom. Here it is. No pretty wrapping, but it seems too lovely a box to cover with silly paper. Mother, I've never seen that box before. Well, now, isn't it nice that I can still have some surprises for you? That's a great-looking box, Mrs. Roston. Those, uh, those are roses painted on ivory, aren't they? Oh, it's so beautiful. I feel as if I'm depriving you of something very special if if I accepted it. Oh, no. Please, take it. It's it's little enough, and you know what I think that box would be perfect for? It already has its purpose, dear. What I was going to say was that it would be the perfect place to keep a lock of your first baby's hair. Wouldn't it? And I'm afraid it's going to stay empty for some time. Oh, George, we don't know that. Not yet. We will have to find you another container for that when the time comes. This box already has its occupant. You mean there's something inside? Well, look and see. Well, go ahead, Laurie. <laughs> My heart's beating so loudly. <laughs> She's been like that all day, so excited. Darling, do you want me to open it? No, no, I'm all right. Just let me take a deep breath. Oh, no. Hey, that's... That's the same... Laurie? What, oh. What's wrong? Mother? Oh, it's his music! Give me the box, Laurie. And inside! Inside! Oh, the ring! Oh! Oh. Oh. I've got her. Put her on the couch. Yes. Laurie? Laurie? Mother, do 
something. Don't just stand there. Eleanor, control yourself and get some water. Oh, Laurie, my poor Laurie. Wake up. Laurie, come out of it, honey. Darling? She's trying to open her eyes. Slowly, Laurie. It's me, George. Oh, who? What, what happened? You just passed out for a moment. Here, give her this water. Here, honey. Sip no, this slowly. I don't need it. But d- did I really see it? See what? The ring. Yes. Yes, I've got it. What What ring? This ring. The same one. With a rose-colored stone. Mother, how dare you? That's mine. You know what that ring means to me. Oh, please take that thing away. I don't want to look at it. Well, don't worry. You won't have to. Here, Mrs. Ralston, take it back. And I hope it isn't a sample of your sense of humor. Just one moment, Mr. Williamson. I don't particularly appreciate your tone or your attitude. What do you mean by my sense of humor? If you and your daughter know all about that axe-murdering scene that we saw earlier, then you must have known about the ring. What about it? It's mine. That ring. It's just like that road sign you have on the highway. Yes, the sign was copied from the design of the ring. It's been our family hallmark, so to speak, for generations. Is that why the girl who killed her father did it? Because of that ring? What do you mean? She had it. She she teased him with it while, while she sang that song. That same nursery rhyme in the box. Oh, oh no. Uh, that couldn't be... That's my ring. She couldn't have had it. Are you too sure you saw this ring? Well, that girl in the field. She dropped it when she ran away. Then where is it now? Well, George, you had it. What? You sure? I I thought you put it into your purse. Well, I'll look. Well, it isn't in any of my pockets. No, and it's not here in my purse. How could it be? There is only one ring, this ring. It's been in the Ralston family for generations. It was brought here by a Ralston early in the 18th century. And it has always belonged to the oldest child in each family. In which case it would be your daughter's, since you are a Ralston by marriage. Yes, that would be so if it were true. Uh, You're not going to tell them. Well, why not? It's time that silly cloud you've been hiding behind was blown away. Don't, Mother, please, I beg you, don't. Nonsense. I am a Roston. That ring belongs to me. Helena's father died in the Southeast Asian War. Shot down even before he knew I was going to have a child. Mother, I hate you for this. I hate you. Helena, don't say that to your own mother. Why not? She's hated me ever since she learned that her father and I had never married. Imagine that in this day. A girl making such a fuss about legitimacy. Stop it, Mother, please. We don't have to hear any more, Mrs. Oh, Wilson. yes, yes, you do. George, can't we get out of here quickly? You can go whenever you like, Miss Thornton. But out of your friendship for Helena, you must take that ring with you. No, I couldn't. I won't let her give it to me. Helena, what are you doing? The ring, she tore it out of my hand. I've got it and no one will ever get it from me. Let her go. She'll be back. And with the ring, she knows it's wrong for her to have taken it. Eventually, the ring must come to you, Laurie. We don't want it. But it will come to you. It can do you no harm. It's a silly superstition, but only Rostons is supposed to be vulnerable to the ring. And, Laurie, if you are Helena's friend, as you say you are, you will take it. But she wants it. She insists that it stay hers. Only as an excuse. But what sort of an excuse could the ring give her? The excuse not to marry. And why not? She considers herself fated, ill-starred, if you will. You see, at one time, the superstition arose that if the firstborn was female, the ring would prevent her from marrying. It's high time that ring is out of Roston hands. Why don't you just throw it away? What, with Helena carrying on as if possessed? Well, we just do not want it. I'm sorry, but we must get back to the city. Uh, Yes, it's a long drive, and we'd like to make it before dark. I regret this has turned out to be so unpleasant. 
But then perhaps it couldn't have been avoided. Perhaps. But it's over now. George, let's go. Oh, oh I can't get away fast enough. I don't know what the speed limit is here, but whatever it is, we'll break it. Helena? I order you to come out of your room at once. At once. Mother, don't hurt her. She is my only friend. The only friend I have in the whole world. Run from the ring. Run for your life. But without a ring... What's a husband or wife? We'll return shortly with Act Three. Let us try and penetrate the shrouding darkness of the final act of A Ring of Roses. Laurie and George have been plunged into a strange, unreal experience. As the twilight lowers over the countryside, they are fleeing from the Rostons, the malevolent nursery rhyme, the flashing axe, the avenging curse, the fatal ring. What can flight outrace those forces of evil? That woman at Mrs. Roston. She's monstrous. Oh, I'm so sorry for Helena. Yeah, well, I didn't see any halos around her head either. Yeah, but just imagine having to live with that mother. Why does she have to tell Helena that she and her father never married? Do you believe it? Well, why would she lie about something that important? Maybe out of just plain malice. Or... Or what? It just occurred to me, couldn't she have invented that story about the curse the ring puts on firstborn Roston girls? Well, to what end? Simple. It'd be a guarantee that she'd never be alone. That she could hold on to her daughter for life. Like the woodcutter. Oh, don't remind me of him. Anyway, I can't see how the ring and whatever it's supposed to do fits. Well, if she made up the business about fate keeping her from marrying Helena's father, now wouldn't that be a kind of... Evidence? Proof for Helena that the curse was real? Well, then why would she give us the ring? Well, I'm only guessing, but couldn't it have been Mrs. Roston's way of telling her daughter that she wouldn't marry even if the ring was off the premises, so to speak? But, George, whatever we think of Mrs. Roston, she's still a mother. And what mother would sentence her daughter to a lifetime of misery? Huh? Look, I'm sorry I got you into this mess. I didn't dream it would be that horrible. Well, you had no way of knowing. Well, looking back, I should have. Helena, always so strange, so withdrawn, so mysterious about herself, her home, and and her mother. It should have been a warning. Honey, let's find a happier subject. Such as? Well, let's see. Uh, Okay, it's not original, but it'll do. For instance... If and when we have our first baby, would you want a boy or a girl? Oh, don't be corny. Why not? Corn is fine as long as it's... George! George, isn't there someone in the road? Where? Well, look, straight ahead. Oh, yeah, that's a woman. Uh, Well, we're not stopping for man or beast or any mixture of the two. Here, that should get her off the road. Because if it doesn't, then she may be another bit of PSP and we can drive right through her. Darling, slow down. She's waving at us. George, slow down! No way. If that's a living body and it wants to stay that way, she'll get off the road. Oh, please. She isn't moving from the middle of the road. Damn her teeth, whoever she is. George, George, you're going to hit her. (laughs) Laurie, all right? Yeah, I think so. That stupid woman. It's Helena. Yeah. Well, just wave goodbye and we'll get going. Laurie, Laurie, please... I must speak to you. Tell her you'll phone her on Halloween. Hey, wait, Laurie, don't lower the window. Well, she's in trouble. Better her than you. There can't be any danger in finding out what she wants. Haven't you been through enough? Helena, we're in a hurry. Telephone Laurie tomorrow. No, don't go, please. Let me explain. George, wait, I don't have the heart wait a to... Minute. Is, are you sure that's Helena? 
Well, of course. Her face, it, it looks so strange. Well, what's strange about her face? Look at her eyes. They're, they're washed out. They're sunken as if, as if she's taken some kind of drug. That's probably because she's been crying. I'm lowering the window. And you're also raising my temper. Well, what do you want me to do? Just wave goodbye and we'll get going. Oh, she's gone to the front of the car now, George. Oh, she does look dreadful. Why not? She is dreadful. I've got to find out what she wants. Just one minute. Let me talk to her for just only one minute. Okay. Sixty seconds. But don't lower the window more than an inch. Helena? Helena, over here. Now, what is it? Oh, thank you, Laurie. If you only knew how miserable I am about what happened today. It was all my fault. You don't have to apologize. It wasn't anybody's uh, fault. Mother had only the best intentions in giving you the ring. Sure she did. Nothing like unloading something on a couple of strangers that isn't yours to give away. But the ring does belong to her mother. Only to be given to her child, which excludes you. Well, that's true, but... You see, after me, there won't be any Rostons. But you will marry, Helena. Just wait and see. <gasps> I doubt it. And even if I did, my children won't be Rostons. Helena, this has been the weirdest day in my life. Now, frankly, the sooner we get away from here, the better off we'll feel. Just one more thing. Prove to me that you are still my friend and... Please, take the ring. No, Helena... Thank you, but I couldn't. Absolutely not. Helena, why don't you just throw that ring away somewhere? I can't. I'm not allowed to. It has to be given to a Roston or, or to the person closest and dearest to me. But how could you expect me to take it? Every time I'd look at it, I would remember that terrible scene in the woods. I swear, the ring has nothing to do with what happened out there. It never has before. This is the first time. And it'll be the last for us. Okay, Helena, stand away from the car. I'm backing up. Laurie, if you don't take the ring, I'll die. I know I'll die. You won't die, Helena. Why should you? Because it will mean that I've lost my only friend and that I'll have no one to turn to and I'll be stuck here in this prison with my mother. And she'll never let me go. Never. So long, Helena. If I return to the house with the ring, my mother will do something terrible. If you don't take the ring, I'll throw myself in front of the car. I don't care anymore. I don't care. Helena, give me the ring. Oh, you mean you will take it? Oh, Laurie, you've made me so happy. I'm indebted to you forever. Forever. You're angry with me, George, aren't you? No. I'll probably never see her again. And if it meant that much to her... What well... probably meant even more to her was that she could twist and bend you in any way she wanted. Well, in a way, it was her last hope of getting out of that house. That's why I finally took the ring. Actually, what harm could it do? I don't know, Laurie, except that anything connected with the Rostons seems dangerous. That's because the Rostons are difficult to understand or explain. Well, that may be. But while we might never get to the bottom of that axe job in the woods, there must be a key somewhere to the Rostons. After all, they're not ghosts or optical illusions. They're people, living, breathing humans. Still, for all we know about them, they're just as haunted as that phantom woodcutter and his crazy daughter. Let's stop talking about them. I will. If you do me an important favor. If I can. You can. Throw that ring away. You mean now? Right this second. Open the window and throw it out. But why? Honey, I consider it a special favor to me if you got rid of that ring. Well, I have no intention of keeping it. But I, I don't want to just throw it away. What do you want to do with it? Give it away. To whom? I haven't thought yet. Try thinking about it right now. You sound as if you're ordering me to do it. Actually, I'm begging you, Laurie, begging you to get rid of the damn ring. I said I would. But when? When I find someone to give it to. Someone who would appreciate it. It just doesn't make sense to just throw away something that's probably valuable for just anyone to find or 
to have it crushed under a car. <sighs> Say, I know what I could do with it. Drop it, Laurie. It's only going to get us into an argument. No, I'm serious, honestly. I just thought of where this ring could do the most good. Fine, you do what you want with it, but let's not talk about it. Oh, you'll agree. I bet you will. Oh, honey, do you realize that since we've known each other, we've never had so many disagreements? But I'm not disagreeing with you. Good, then let's change the subject. Or better still, let's, let's let everything take a rest. If that's what you want, fine. Laurie, what are you doing? Nothing. Laurie, what are you doing with that ring? Nothing, I said. Besides, you don't want to talk about it. Why are you wearing it? I was playing with it. I just wanted to see if it fit. Will you please take it off? What are you getting so excited about? That ring. If you can't throw it away, at least put it away. You're getting awfully bossy, George. You're doing it only to get a rise out of me. You can forget about it. Because I'm going to give it to that thrift shop around the corner from where I live. Great idea. Now, please take it off. All right. Anything for some peace. <sighs> hey, that's funny. What is? <sighs> the ring's stuck. I, I'll get it off. You shouldn't have put it on if it was too small. But it wasn't. In fact, it felt too big. Isn't that strange? I I can't even twist it. Get the flashlight out of the glove compartment. Now turn it on and hold your finger under the light. There, can you see it? Your finger doesn't look swollen. No, it isn't swollen. But, but the ring won't budge. George? George, do you hear something? Hear what? That voice. The singing. Don't you hear it? No, I don't. Wait. Yes, I do. It's that song. Where's it coming from? I don't know. It seems to be surrounding us. I'll turn the bright lights on. You keep trying to get that ring off. Um, I am trying, but it's as if it's cemented to my finger. And that singing. It's the same as the girls in the forest. Get rid of the flash and give me your hand. What for? Maybe I can get it off. Well, you can't. You're trying. There's no traffic, Laurie. I can manage the wheel with one hand. Why don't we wait till we get to a gas station? Then I can get it off with a little soap. Come on, give me your hand. All right. No, wait. I can't. Why not? Oh, I just can't, George. Lori, you're about to drive me out of my head. Why can't you give me your hand? Because, because I remembered something. What, for heaven's sake, what, Lori? Well, what Helena said back there when, when she wanted me to take the ring. She said a lot of hysterical things. That if she couldn't give the ring to a Rostin, it would have to be to a person nearest and dearest to her. Oh, Helena's all whacked up. Now give me your hand, Lori. But what if it's true? Oh, that voice, that terrible voice. Why doesn't it stop? Lori, please give me your hand. No, because if you can get it off, then you'll be stuck with it. Who cares? I don't want anything to happen to you. Not for anything. <gasps> George, George, look straight ahead. Oh, it's them, no. the two of them, the old man and the girl. He's got an axe. I'm stopping the car. No, don't. Go around them. Throw them. Throw them down. Kill them. Do anything, the brakes George. aren't working. George, we're practically on top of Lauren, them. for the last time, give me your hand. The ring can't oh, harm us. No! <laughs> Laurie, are you all right? It was a tree we hit. Only, only a tree, Laurie. You hear me? It's only a tree. <sighs> Laurie. The ring. The ring. What did you do? It's not on your finger. Your finger. 
finger. Good Lord. She's dead. So you gave Laurie the ring, Helena. Yes, Mother. As you told me to. Now give me the box. And we'll see if the ring has worked wonders once more. Here is the box. The one with the roses. Open it. Yes, Mother. But the music. Why isn't the music playing? It's a good sign that it's not playing. It's the sign that the ring has done its work. Your friend Laurie will not marry ever. Not ever. But the ring, Mother. Where is the ring? You'll find it in the woods. In the clearing. In the same place where I killed your great-grandfather 143 years ago. Go and bring back the ring that will keep us alive forever. Forever. Forever, you ghosts. Forever, you sing. But your death is as forever as your grim, rosy ring. I'll be back shortly. Let us end our tale of ring a ring of roses. For as we also know, roses are red, roses are blue. But the rose of death is meant for who? Our cast included Glynis O'Connor, George Petrie, Sidney Walker, Elspeth Eric, Holland Taylor, and Carol Hilliard. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. G. Marshall. Welcome to the sound of suspense. Welcome to the fear you can hear. But mostly to the world of terrifying imagination. In the next 52 minutes, you'll hear a story about a girl with a most unusual talent. A talent for finding lost dolls or dead bodies. You may not be glad you met Iris Lloyd, but we don't think you'll forget her. And Faith! And Faith! I'm here! I'm here! Come and find me! Where are you? Oh, my poor darling! Where are you? Help me! Help me! It's so dark, and I'm afraid! <laughs> Our mystery drama, The Girl Who Found Things, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Henry Sletzer and stars Norman Rose. It is sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal, and by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. of the girl who found things. It begins serenely enough in the pleasant little town of Medvale. 
but with a woman who is preparing to leave it just as soon as her taxi arrives. Come in, Lucas. The door is open. Oh, for heaven's sakes, that man's dead. Oh, evening, Miss Wheeler. I hope I'm not too early. No, I'm all packed. Uh, you can take that trunk in the hallway first. Then I've got a few small suitcases, but they can go on the back seat with me. Yes, ma'am. Uh, is that all you're taking to Europe? I sent the rest ahead to the ship. Well, go on, Lucas. Start loading that taxi. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, I was just wondering if there is something you wanted me to do in the house for closing it up, you know. It's all been done, Lucas. You sure you turned off the gas, electricity? How about the fireplace? I see you had a fire this morning. Are you sure it's good and cold? Oh, I suppose you could check it again just in case. Better safe than sorry, they say. <laughs> uh, seems to me you've got a couple of embers burning there. Maybe I could put them out with a shovel. Please hurry, Lucas. Yes, ma'am. I'm going about this as fast as I can. Uh, you see... This isn't easy for me. What isn't? Lucas, for heaven's sake, put the shovel back. You're tracking ashes all over the floor. Ah, please. Please, turn around, Miss Wheeler. Don't look at me. Lucas, are you crazy? I can't do this if you're looking at me. Lucas, put that down. I'm sorry, Miss Wheeler. Ah! do it, Miss Wheeler. I had to. Now I got to pick you up. Take you outside through the woods. That's where I got to bury you, Miss Wheeler. <laughs> How much farther, David? We've been driving for hours. Almost there, darling. Just relax. Tell me more about your Aunt Faith. I don't really feel prepared to meet her. No one's ever fully prepared for Aunt Faith. I warn you that she's something of a character. Mm, just waiting to be discovered by Monthly Digest. Well, anyway, after my mother died, she became less auntie and more motherly. That's why she was so upset when I got married and failed to do my filial duty. By bringing your bride home for approval. Mm, something like that. I suppose she's going to resent me for being two years too late. Well, take my word for it. She'll be crazy about you. But remember what I said. She's an old gypsy. Don't be surprised if she drags out a crystal ball and starts predicting your future. Uh, speaking of which, there's our future for the next few months straight ahead of us. The old homestead. David, is that you? It's us, Aunt Faith. Oh, oh David, <laughs> my handsome boy. Hello, Aunt Faith. Oh, I'm so glad to see you. Oh, it's wonderful seeing you. Uh, uh, Aunt Faith, meet Rowena. Well, and it's about time. Hello, Mrs. Demarest. Nice to meet you at last. <laughs> Oh, David, she's beautiful. <laughs> well, come inside. Come in. I've got a fire going. Let me take your coat, my dear. Oh, what a lovely fur. What is it? Mink sable. Uh, I told Rowena she ought to wear the label on the outside so that people... Oh. Oh, well, I, I didn't know that you had company, Auntie. Oh, yes. David, this is Lieutenant Reese. Lieutenant, this is my nephew, David Wheeler, and his wife, Rowena. Ah, Lieutenant. Uh, that isn't a military title, is it? Uh, no, sir. I'm with the police. Oh, of course. Well, how do you do? I'm sorry we have to meet this way, but then I always seem to meet people when they're in trouble. Of course, I've known Mrs. Demarest for some time. Well, Lieutenant Reese has been a wonderful help of my charity work, David. And he's been such a comfort since this awful thing happened. Yes. Oh, well, it's been years since I was in this room. I'd appreciate it if you and I could have a word alone. Oh? Oh, Rowena, I'll tell you what. Why don't you and I go upstairs and I'll show you your room? Yes, that would be fun. I can even show you the room where David was born and his old nursery. Well, uh, how long has it been since you left Medvale, Mr. Wheeler? Oh, maybe ten years. I've been back here on visits, of course. Once when my father died four years ago. As you know, our family business is down south. Yes, yes, I know. You and your sister... My half-sister. 
Uh, yes, you and your half-sister, Geraldine. Uh, you were the only proprietors of the mill, weren't you? Mm-hmm, that's right. But you did most of the managing, I gather. When your parents died, Miss Wheeler kept the estate and you went to Virginia to manage the mill. That's how it was, right? That's how it was. Successfully, would you say? Uh, Lieutenant, I'm going to save you a great deal of time. Geraldine and I didn't get along. We saw as little of each other as we both could arrange, and that was very little. Thank you for being frank. I can even guess your next question, Lieutenant. You'd like to know when I saw Geraldine last. When did you? Three months ago in Virginia, on her semi-annual visit to the mill. But you were in Medvale after that, weren't you? Well, yes, I came up to see Geraldine in March on a business matter. As my aunt may have told you, Geraldine refused to see me. Now, what sort of business matter was it? I wanted Geraldine to approve a bank loan I wished to make to purchase new equipment. She was against it, wouldn't even discuss it. So I went home. And you never saw her again? Never. And in case you're wondering, Lieutenant, I have no idea where she is. No idea at all. Sure you don't want some tea, Rowena? No, thank you, Aunt Faith. I'll stick to scotch. Oh, have some tea, darling. Auntie wants to read your future in the leaves. Oh, I wish I could read the future. Or rather the past. Well, you're thinking about Geraldine. I simply can't understand what became of her, David. She was all set for that trip to Europe. Some of her bags were already on the ship. You remember Lucas, the taxi driver? Oh, yes, of course. Well, he came out here to pick her up, take her to the station, but she wasn't here. She wasn't anywhere. Well, I suppose the police checked all the usual sources. Hospital, morgues, everywhere. Uh, Lieutenant Reese said anything could have happened to her. She might have been robbed and murdered. She might have lost her memory. She might even have... Well, this I'd never believe, but Lieutenant Reese said she might have disappeared deliberately with some man. I know what happened to her. Do you? She just left. She just walked out of this big, gloomy house and this crawly little town. She was sick of living alone. David, I have an idea about how we can find Geraldine. Really? I'm going to ask Iris Lloyd where Geraldine is. <laughs> ask who? Iris Lloyd... Now, don't tell me you've never heard of the child. For there was a story in the papers about her only two months ago, and heaven knows I've mentioned her in my letters a dozen times. I remember. She's the one who's psychic or something. Some sort of orphan? Yes, Iris is a ward of the state, a resident at the Medvale Home for Girls. I've been vice chairman of the place for donkey's years. That's how I know her. Well, she's 16, David, and absolutely uncanny. And what makes her such a phenomenon? She's a seer, David. A genuine clairvoyant. Oh, not a medium at 16. Oh, no. I suppose you could call her a, a finder. She seems to have the ability to find things that are lost. People, too. How does she do it? I'm not sure Iris knows herself. The gift hasn't made the poor child happy. Such talents rarely do. You know, one day, the home had a picnic at Crompton Lake. They discovered an eight-year-old named Dorothea was missing. They couldn't find her until Iris Lloyd began screaming. Screaming? These insights cause a great pain. But she was able to describe the place where Dorothea could be found, where the girl had sprained her ankle. Oh, you're right, Auntie, darling. I don't agree with you. Let's just leave the search to the police. David. David, I've arranged with the home for Iris to spend some time with us. Are you serious? You invited that girl here? Well, she has to become acquainted with Geraldine's aura, don't you see? The aura that's still in this house. Well, I won't have it. I, I'm sorry, Annie, but the whole thing's ridiculous. Oh, I knew you would object, David, but I'm afraid I have to insist. We're picking up the girl this afternoon. Oh, really now, Aunt Faith? You understand, my dear, don't you? Well, yes, I understand, Mrs. Demerick. And I'm looking forward to meeting Iris Lloyd. <laughs> Come in, Mrs. Demarest. I suppose this is the nephew you told me about. Yes, sister. This is Mr. David Wheeler. David, this is Sister Clotilde, who runs the home. Well, how do you do, sister? How do you do? In case your aunt hasn't told you, Mr. Wheeler, I'm not at all in favor of this move. I think it's wrong to encourage Iris in this 
delusion of hers. Well, then you and I agree with each other, sister. Oh, it's not a delusion, Sister Clotilde. It's a gift from God. She's undisciplined. You might even say wild. But you are letting us have her, sister. She can come home with us. Did you think my poor objections carry any weight, Mrs. Demarest? One moment. Sister Pauline, would you send Iris Lloyd in now? Shall I come in? Yes, Iris, come in. Iris, you know Mrs. Demarest. This is her nephew, Mr. Wheeler. Hello. Hello. You remember me, Iris. I've been coming here at least three or four times a year to see all you girls. Yes, Mrs. Demarest. Now, the directors have been good enough to let us take you home with us for a while. We need your help, Iris. We want you to see if you can find someone who is lost. Yes, Mrs. Demarest. I'd like to come home with you. I'd like to help you find Mrs. Wheeler. Then you... You know about my poor niece, Iris? The Secret Service couldn't have secrets here, Mrs. Demarest. You know how girls are. Uh, Well, I guess we can get started any time if Miss Lloyd is ready. Please, call her Iris, Mr. Wheeler. Remember that you're still dealing with a child. Iris, I hope you'll enjoy staying with us. I have a lovely room for you. I'm sure you'll like it. You know what I'd really like? What's that? A cigarette. (gasps) Iris! Don't tell me you smoke, Iris. Only when I can get away with it. Well, you're not getting away with it now, for heaven's sake. Oh, never mind, never mind. Uh, Hello there, Mr. Wheeler. Oh, Lucas. Well, how are you? How's the taxi business, hmm? Could I talk to you a minute, Mr. Wheeler? Uh, No, Lucas, I'm sorry. I've got to get these groceries home. We have company for dinner tonight. She's at your place, ain't she? That girl. What girl? That Iris Lloyd. The girl who finds things. I'm afraid of her, Mr. Wheeler. I'm afraid she'll find out what we did. Shut up. Don't you ever say anything like that to me again. I'm scared, Mr. Wheeler. I'm telling you, that girl is peculiar. She knows what you're thinking, they say. She knows where you can find anything, even dead bodies. Get away from me, Lucas. I told you to keep away from me when I came here. Now, get away from my car before I run you down. But I'm scared. I'm scared of that little girl. Lucas, the taxi driver, Lucas, the murderer, is scared. But David Wheeler seems to be frightened, too. And maybe we'll learn if the fright is justified when we return shortly with Act Two. Let's go back to the little town of Medvale for the second act of The Girl Who Found Things. David Wheeler has just returned from his shopping trip, but he finds things are different in the big house at the end of the road. What happened here, Rowena? This room looks like a cyclone hit it. It was Hurricane Iris. What are you talking about? Aunt Faith caught her sweet little orphan Annie in here smoking one of my cigarettes. I didn't hear the whole argument, but I'll tell you one thing. That girl has the vocabulary of a longshoreman. <laughs> well, maybe that'll knock some sense into Aunt Faith. Iris started throwing things, and that's when Aunt Faith went upstairs to lie down. I'll go and see her. Tell her to take her psychic delinquent back where she came from. I wouldn't bother her now. She's not feeling well. Hmm. Well, I'll see the little monster then. Where is she? Next door to us, in Geraldine's room. Iris? Iris, it's Mr. Wheeler. May I come in? Hello, handsome. Auntie says you went shopping. What have you been up to, Iris? Now, my aunt isn't a well woman, and we won't put up with any bad behavior. Now, what happened downstairs? Nothing. I found a button in ashtray and took a couple of drags. You think I was committing a mortal sin the way she yelled at me? I heard you did some fancy yelling yourself. Is, uh, is that what the sisters taught you at the home? 
they didn't teach me anything worthwhile. Well, maybe you need more instruction. Maybe you better get back there as soon as possible. Oh, Mr. Wheeler, please. Oh, I'm awfully sorry. I didn't mean to do anything wrong. I, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, oh, please don't send me back. No, no, wait. Oh, oh, wait a minute now. Oh, please don't do it. Oh, don't. <laughs> What's going on? Oh, Mrs. Demarest, I'm so sorry. I don't know what came over me. It, it was the devil. I'm sure it was the devil. Trying to take my body and... Oh, there, there. I think it's all right, dear. I know you didn't mean what you said. No, it's a gift that makes you this way. And and don't worry about what I asked you to do. You take your time about Geraldine. Take as long as you like. Oh, but I want to help. I really do, Aunt Faye. Now, wait a minute, Auntie. You're not going to fall for this... Oh, listen. Listen. Do you know something? I can feel your niece in this house, Aunt Faye. I really can. I can feel her in this room, whispering to me, trying to tell me where she is. Can you, Iris? Can you really? For heaven's sake, Addie, can't you see that I she... can. I, I can. I, I can feel her everywhere. I can almost touch Miss Wheeler. Oh, is this her closet? These are her clothes. Oh, they're so beautiful. She must have looked beautiful in them. Has Iris ever seen a photo of Geraldine? Oh, look at this one. It's all gold. All shiny gold. And it's so long. Was she very tall? It's an evening gown, Iris. Oh, I can sense her in this gown. I can. I just know I'm going to be able to find her for you, Aunt Faith. I know it. Yes. Yes, I believe that too, my child. Won't you have some more of the beef, Rowena? No, thank you. And we'd better save some for Iris. Something tells me that little girl has a very big appetite. Well, I wish she'd come downstairs. I told her dinner would be served at 7.30. Would you like me to go upstairs and see if she's all right? No, no. I'm sure she'll be down in a moment. You've really forgiven her completely, haven't you? Of course. Oh, you don't understand psychic personality, David. It wasn't her swearing at me this afternoon. It was this, this demon which possesses her. The same spirit that gives her the gift of insight. David, your fork. Take a look at what's coming downstairs in a gold lamé evening gown. For heaven's sake. Hello, everyone. Iris. Whatever are you wearing? You go upstairs and get that dress off. You have no right to wear my sister's clothes. Take it off? Why should I? You heard me. Get that dress back in the closet. I won't. I won't, Aunt Faith. No, I won't take it off. You know what I told you. I have to wear your niece's clothes so I can feel her, her aura. You're going to feel my foot in about five seconds if you don't go upstairs. No, everybody in this house hates me. I don't. No, please don't cry. Oh, David, you shouldn't talk that way to the poor girl. I won't stay here. I won't help you find your niece, that's all. You can't do anything of the kind and you know it. Iris, Iris, listen to me. Iris, you remember those things you did at the home? The way you found things for Sister Therese? Yes. Do you think you could do something like that again? Right now for us? I, I, I don't know. I could try. Would you let her try, David? I don't know what you mean. Now, I want you to hide something or name some object you've lost or misplaced, perhaps somewhere in this house. This is silly. It's a parlor game. The least you can do is try it. All right. How do we play this game of hide-and-seek? David, what about the cat? The cat? You remember. You once told me about a wool kitten you used to have as a child. You said you lost it somewhere in the house when you were five, and you were so unhappy about it you wouldn't eat for days. Well... That's 30 years ago, Rowena. All the better. All the better, David. Iris, do you think you could find it? Could you find David's claw kitten? Oh, I'm not sure. I'm never sure. Just try, Iris. We won't blame you if you fail. It, it might have been thrown out ages ago, but try anyway. All right. I will. But you'll have to shut off the lights. And then what? Burn incense and chant? David, please, turn off the room. I'll right. do it. There, Iris. The room is dark enough, isn't it? Yes, yes. It's dark enough when I close my eyes. What's she doing? Breathing, obviously. I think she's going into a trance. 
It's so hard to know if she's faking or not, isn't it? Not for me, darling. She isn't, David. I know she isn't. She's in a genuine trance. Oh. Hot. Oh, it's so hot. She's sweating. So hot. She isn't faking that, David. Oh. be talking about the world cat. Well, what if she is? Oh, please. Please, somebody. Help. Help Kitty. Help her. Please help Kitty. Ah! Ah! Oh, ah! The girl is in pain. It's an act, I tell you. Hot. Behind the stove. So hot. Kitty, so hot. Oh! Behind the stove. Is that what she said? Iris. Iris, darling, are you all right? David, turn on the lights quickly. Auntie, it was all gibberish. For Weena, it's just nonsense. You're so stubborn, David. Well, she said it clearly. The kitten's behind the stove. Well, you probably stopped it when you were a little brat of a boy. We could find out, couldn't we? Is the same stove still in the kitchen? I suppose so. There's a microwave oven, too, but they've never moved the old iron monster. Let's look, David, please. I can't feel anything behind here. Well, try the other side, David. Oh, this is ridiculous. Well, look, my, my, my hands are getting filthy. Here, use this ladle. But it's no use, Rowena. It, it, it simply can't... It, it can't... David, what is it? Did you touch something? Huh? Oh, yes. Something, I don't know what. Well, can you get it out? Well, yes, I, I think so. Oh, good Lord. David! It's a... A wool cat. Yes. It's so filthy and old, but it's still a cat, isn't it? Is it the one you lost? Is it? Uh, yes, yes, it's the one. David, you look so strange. You look frightened. <laughs> Iris, having a picnic all by yourself? I just thought I'd lie on the grass for a while. Mm. What are you doing with the daisy? Loves me? Loves me not? Uh huh. Want to finish it off for me, Uncle David? Cut out the Uncle David stuff. I'll finish it for you then. She loves me. She loves me not. She loves me. She loves me not. Too bad, Uncle David. She just doesn't love you. Who? <laughs> Your wife, of course. Who else? <laughs> Bye now. Uh, Iris, Iris, wait. Yes? Uh, look, I, uh, I want to talk to you a minute. Really? Iris, what's the story with you? You've been here over a week and you haven't done anything about... Well, you know what? This is just a great big picnic for you, isn't it? Hmm. What if it is? You think I want to go back to the creepy home... It's better here. No uniforms, no no 6 a.m. prayers, none of that junk they call food. Also, I like the company. I suppose I should say thank you. There's nothing you can say. I, I don't know already. <laughs> I'm psychic, remember? Mm. What about that, Iris? Is it just some kind of trick? You can tell me. Mm, I'll show you if it's a trick. Want me to uh, tell you all about yourself? All right, go ahead. Okay. Your wife hates you. She thinks you're rotten. You weren't even married a year when you started running around with other women. You never went to the mill, not more than once or twice a month. That was how you ran the business. All you knew how to do was spend the money. You little brat. You're not psychic. You're an eavesdropper. Oh, let's go of my arm. Your room is right next door. You've been listening. You think I could help hearing you two arguing? No, I guess you couldn't. I'm, I'm sorry. Iris, I hope I didn't hurt you. I know a way you can make it up to me. Hmm? Like this. Go oh, oh, hey, Now cut that out, will you? <laughs> Don't you want to kiss me? No, you dumb kid. I'm not a kid. I'm almost 17. You were 16 three months ago. I'm a woman. But you're not even a man. David? Yes, Auntie, it's me. Oh, did you call for a taxi? A taxi? No, why should I? Oh, I don't know, but Lucas's cab is in the driveway. He said he was waiting for you. Lucas? Well, I'd better go and see what he wants. Dinner will be ready around 7, David. Uh, 
All right, Lucas. What are you doing here? I... I had to talk to you, Mr. Wheeler. I... wanted you to know how it went. I did what you told me, exactly like you said. I hit her clean. She didn't hurt a bit. No blood. All right. I don't want to hear about it anymore, Lucas. I'm... I'm satisfied. And you should be, too. You got your money. Now forget about it. I picked up Miss Wheeler and I took her out in the woods as far as I could. I dug deep, Mr. Wheeler. I did a good job. I smoothed it over and spread them leaves so as nobody had guessed it was there. Nobody except... Oh, so it's that girl you're still worried about. I heard awful funny things about her, Mr. Wheeler. About her finding things. Finding that little girl that fell near Crumpton Lake. Maybe she can see right into your sister's grave. Iris Lloyd won't find her. Nobody will. But she's right behind the house, Mr. Wheeler. She's so close. Right in the woods. You've got to forget it, Lucas. Like it never happened. My sister's disappeared and she's not coming back. As for the girl, don't believe what you hear. Nobody can see into a grave, Lucas. Nobody. Is David Wheeler really as convinced as he sounds? Or can Lucas detect the doubt in his voice and the fear in his eyes? We'll learn more about the girl who found things when we return shortly with Act Three. return to the Wheeler house in the town of Medvale. A house filled with people waiting for a psychic revelation from the girl who found things. But that revelation appears to be very slow in coming. That girl has been here for how long? Two weeks? It seems like two months. And she hasn't done a thing but enjoy herself. David, what's the point of our staying on? You said you had some affairs to settle. You don't seem to be conducting any business at all. Well, I haven't been in the mood for business. That's nothing very new, is it? How long are you going to keep that light on? I'd like to get some sleep. If you think Iris Lloyd is indulging herself, what about you? Shh, be quiet. I told you that she can hear every nasty little quarrel in this room. That's why I asked for a truce. Well, she doesn't have to eavesdrop, does she? Can't she read minds? Well, she's not the only clairvoyant around here. I can read her mind, too. Oh, she's a child, for heaven's sake. She's in love with you. Of course, there's a minor obstruction in her plans, a small matter of your wife. But then I've never been much of a hindrance to your romances, have I? I thought you agreed to that truce. <laughs> you are a pacifist, David. That's part of your charm. That's why you came up here in March, wasn't it? To make peace with Geraldine. I came here on business. You came to keep Geraldine from sending you to prison. That was the business. You know nothing about it. I have eyes, David. I know you were taking money from the mill. Too much money. Geraldine knew it, too. How much time did she give you to make up the loss? All right. If you won't let me get some sleep here, I'll sleep in the library. David! David, is that you? Uh, yes. Yes, Aunt Faith. What are you doing up? Oh, I, I heard a noise. Oh, well, it was me, probably. I, I was just going down to the library to... I'll find a book to read. No, it wasn't you. David, hmm? look. What? Oh, it's Iris. Yes, in her nightgown. What's she doing in the front hall, dressed like that? David, she's sleepwalking. What? Look at her eyes. David, we have to follow no, her. No, let, let her alone, Annie. You're not supposed to disturb a sleepwalker, are you? I've got to follow her. All right, I'll, I'll come with you. David... She's talking to herself. Can you hear her? What did I forget? What did I forget? Did you hear that? Did, did, did you hear what she said? Yes, but I, I don't understand it. Why doesn't the taxi get here? Why doesn't it get here? Taxi? She said something about a taxi, David. Yes, yes, I, I, I heard her. Oh, we have to be going to the station. 
I'm so nervous. I'm always so nervous when I go on a trip. Please get my luggage. My luggage. Oh, dear God, David. She's in a trance. She's talking the way... Oh, what did I forget? Gas? Electricity? Telephone? The fireplace? Is the fireplace cold? <gasps> oh, no! Not the fireplace! Not the fireplace! Oh, what does she mean? I don't know, but... Auntie, I think this is wrong. I think we should get her back to bed. No. Don't touch her, David. Don't. Look. Hmm? She's heading for the back of the house. Come on. Yes. Yes, we've got to follow her. I think she means to go outside. We can't let her do that. Maybe it's important. Maybe it's something to do with Geraldine. Don't be insane. She's just sleepwalking, that's all it is. Iris. Iris, wake up. David, don't. You must You want that girl to catch pneumonia? Iris. No. Iris. Don't. Please. Iris. Iris, wake up. Don't. Oh, David, in front of you, don't. You're not supposed to wake a sleepwalker. Everybody knows that. Let me go. Stop it. Help me. Iris. Help me. Iris, it's only me, Iris. He's trying to kill me. He wants to kill me. <laughs> no, 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 darling. It's all right. It's only us. Wake up, I said. Wake up. Oh, you poor child. You poor baby. Oh, oh David, that was a cruel thing to do. Oh, and say yes. Iris, I'm here. I'm here. Oh, are you all right? Oh, yes. Yes, I'm all right now. Oh. I was so frightened for you, dear. Yes, but I'm all right. I think... I I think that I'm ready. Ready? What do you mean, dear? I think I can do it now. I think I might be able to tell you. You mean... You mean where Geraldine is? Yes. I think I can. David, we've got to call Lieutenant Reese. Reese? At this hour? I told him I would call him whenever Iris thought she knew something. I promised him I'd call. But it's almost midnight, Auntie. He'll come. I know he will. I'll telephone him myself. You take Iris to her room. Oh, yes. Uh, yes, all right. Uh, uh, come on, Iris. Yes, Uncle David. Well, Uncle David, are you scared? What are you talking about? You look scared. Scared of me. Shut up. <laughs> I thought you would be. The minute you heard that I was ready... I'm sending you back. Iris, you're a fake. Even your sleepwalking act was a fake. Oh, David, David. You're so cute. You really are. But you know what? I don't have to be ready. I don't have to do anything at all when that policeman gets here. Not if you don't want me to. You... You don't know what you're talking about. You better kiss me now, David. You better kiss me. And make it really good. All right. All right, if that's what you want. Mm. David! Ah! Get out of here! I don't want you in my room! Rowena! You were right about the walls between these rooms, David. You can hear every little thing. I hate you! David hates you, too! Tell her, David, why don't you tell her? Yes. Why don't you, David? It's the only thing you haven't done so far. David! Uh, yes, Aunt Faith? Oh, I just spoke to Lieutenant Reese. He says he's on his way. What for? Oh, you are ready, Iris, aren't you? You're ready to tell us where Geraldine is? Yes. I'm ready to tell you, Aunt Faith. More than ready. Are you sure she's all right, Mrs. Demarest? She looks awfully pale to me. Iris always looks that way when she enters the trance. It's a fraud, Lieutenant. The whole thing is a fraud. You mustn't be taken in. Well, I'm just trying to keep an open mind, Mr. Wheeler. Oh, it's starting. I think she's going to say something. Oh, now, no. Iris, look, you've got to stop this. That girl is working herself into some kind of fit. It's all her own doing, isn't it? Well, uh, maybe Mr. Wheeler's right. The girl might do herself some harm. No, no, you must wait. Listen, listen. Lord, it's her. Oh, where are you? Oh, Geraldine, my poor darling. Where are you? Help me, help me. It's so dark. And 
Where? Oh, Geraldine, where? Tell us where you are. Some place far away. A place with ships. The sun is shining. I saw hills and green trees. There are bells ringing in the street. She's out of her head completely. A place with ships, bells ringing in the streets. I see water. A bridge. Trolley cars in the street. Going up and down the hill. San Francisco. I'm sure she means San Francisco. Yes, it sounds like it. Iris, do you mean San Francisco? Is that where Geraldine is? Yes. Yes. That's where she is. Well, who knows? It's as good a guess as I've heard. Uh, has Miss Wheeler ever been in San Francisco before? Never. Why would she go there? David? <laughs> I really wouldn't know. But if that's where Iris says she is, I, I guess the spirits know what they're talking about. She's waking up. I want to go home. Oh, please, somebody take me home. To Sister Clotilda. <laughs> Your idea was a huge success, Auntie. But I can't say that I'm not glad to see little Iris back where she belongs. Yes, the poor child. It's the only home she knows. Mm. Now all the police have to do is find Geraldine in San Francisco. If she hasn't taken a boat to South America by now. I, I just don't understand it. it. It's not like Geraldine to run away without a word. Well, here we are. Home again. <sighs> Aren't you coming in, David? Oh, not just yet. I thought I'd go into town and pick up some champagne. I thought we'd celebrate a bit tonight. Well, hello, Lucas. How's the taxi business, huh? Uh, could be better. You uh, got any news for me, Mr. Wheeler? Oh, yes, Lucas. I've got good news. It's all over. Iris Lloyd is back at the Medvale School for Girls. Then she didn't know. She couldn't find out where, the, where that woman was. She didn't know, Lucas. Just as I promised. Uh-huh. <laughs> I did the right thing. I know it was the right thing, Mr. Weir, but I didn't want to tell you. Uh, right thing? What do you mean? Well, I figured that girl could tell if the body was buried right outside the house, but she'd never find it if it was someplace else, someplace far away. Lucas, what are you talking about? I went out into the woods last week and dug up that woman's body. I put it in that trunk of hers, Mr. Wheeler, and I sent it by train far away as I could. Too far away for that girl. Yes, sir. Excuse me, Mr. Wheeler. What? Oh, oh uh, Lieutenant Reese. I wonder if we could have a talk, Mr. Wheeler? About what? We've received a telegram from the West Coast. Now, the police out there didn't have any luck tracing your sister, but they did have a report on a steamer trunk. A trunk? It was an unclaimed baggage at the Southern Pacific Depot. It was shipped from Medvale only last week, and... Well, it had Miss Wheeler's initials on it. No, it had more than that. So, can we go somewhere and talk about San Francisco? Well, Iris Lloyd is back in her own bed tonight, and her dreams will probably be peaceful. But... David Wheeler is in for a nightmare that may last him for the rest of his life. I'll be back shortly. Do you think you have clairvoyant powers? Have you ever had the experience of finding something that everyone else thought was lost? Actually, you've done exactly that. You found the magical world of radio drama. And now that you've made this find, we hope you'll come back for more suspenseful dramas to play inside the theater of your mind. 
Our cast included Norman Rose, Bryna Rayburn, Robert Dryden, Martha Greenhouse, Barbara Caruso, and Anne Costello. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. All right, Mr. Thompson, I'm a human being, too, and I guess if I got a letter telling me that I was rich, I wouldn't go into mourning. I'd probably go out and celebrate. That's why I wanted to see you, to suggest arranging that happy event without the slightest trouble on your part, without any obligation until you're completely satisfied. Now, in a short time, you'll receive another letter from Johannesburg informing you of the sad news that your cousin, Mr... Well, I still won't reveal his name. Let him remain anonymous. That'll make your decision a great deal easier, I'm sure. What decision? The decision to inherit his estate. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Welcome to the sound of suspense, the voices of victims, the fear you can hear. For the next 52 minutes, we're going to take you into the world of mystery and murder, but mostly into the world of terrifying imagination. The story you're about to hear might be called a morality play. It's a story which has a question you can ask yourself. What is your price tag for killing a man? If you think you don't have one, listen to the story of Walter Van Haas and the Chinaman Button. Mr. Van Haas, I'm making this as easy for you as... as pushing a button. Now, if you give your approval, my agents in Johannesburg will be contacted within hours. The rest will be handled simply and with dispatch. My God, I really think you mean it. I really think you'd commit murder. Our mystery drama, The Chinaman Button, was written especially for the Radio Mystery Theater by Henry Slesser and stars Paul Hecht. It is sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. And now, Act One of the Chinaman Button. But it does not begin in China. It begins in New York City on the executive floor of a bustling advertising agency. Good morning, Susan. How have you been? How is Hawaii? Oh, just great. Are you a person? <laughs> My partner getting yet, or is he goofing off? Oh, no. Mr. Michaels is in his office. He's been there since 8 o'clock. Oh, don't give me that. I'll bet Lou hasn't been in the office before 10 since I went on vacation. Well, what do you know? There you are, just like Susan said. Hello, Phil. Welcome back. How do I look? Fat and sassy? Three weeks in Hawaii, luau every night, plenty of rum and pineapple. I figured I gained ten pounds. Well, it looks good on you, Phil. No kidding. What is this? What's the matter with you? <laughs> I'm nice and brown. You're white as a sheet. You look terrible. Lou, are you sick or something? No, I'm okay. I'm fine. You look like you've been sleeping in the office or something. Well, let's hear it. There's some bad news, right? Something happened while I was away? Yeah, that's right. Something's happened, Phil, but... It wasn't my fault, so help me. Okay, come on, let's have it. We lost an account, Phil. Okay, so we lost an account. We lost a Brewster account. 
You want to tell me that again? I know it's real bad news, but I don't know how else to tell you. Brewster's definitely out. You want to tell me what you did wrong, Lou? Well, nothing, Phil. I swear it. It'll come out sooner or later. Phil, I had nothing to do with it. It started with a call from Charlie Edwards a week after you left. He wanted to talk to you. He said it was urgent. When I told him you weren't here, he hung up. Next thing I know, there's a letter from old man Bruce the official 90-day notice of termination. But did you call Charlie? Well, sure, I called him. Only Charlie isn't the ad manager anymore. Charlie's got a new job. He was kicked upstairs. He's in customer relations, out of advertising completely. There's a new guy in charge. Lou, you know what you're telling me. You are telling me that our gross profit has been cut in half. You think I don't know that? I think I'd better sit down. The new ad manager's name is Walter Van Haas. Six million dollars in billing? Just, just like that? Charlie said the whole thing was his fault. Whose? Walter Van Haas, the new ad manager. Charlie says he started the whole thing, but I never got the full story. Charlie's been too busy in his new job to talk to me. Give me that phone. Yeah, sure, sir. Charlie is not going to be too busy to talk to me. I haven't been kicking back ten grand a year to Charlie for him not to talk to me. You want to know who Walter Van Haas is? I'll tell you, Phil. He's a Boy Scout. And he won his merit badge for backstabbing. So, Walter Van Haas is a backstabber. How did he get close enough to do the job? He's my assistant. He's been my assistant for like eight months. How come I never knew him? Because that's the kind of guy Walter is. He keeps in the background. He's a mouse, Phil. A 200-buck-a-week mouse. Only this mouse roared like a lion, right? Two weeks ago, he came running into my office with a box full of invoices. It seems he was conducting a private investigation, Phil. Can you believe that guy? He was checking into all the supplier bills you guys sent over. He was actually checking out every engraver, every stat house, every printer, every artist bill. Phil, he found overcharges like 50, 60, even 100%. You were his boss, Charlie. Why didn't you tell him what to do with his invoices? He thought I'd be shocked. He wanted us both to go to old man Brewster and expose your agency. That's when I did the only sensible thing. And what was that? I offered him part of my take. A third of it. Phil, he practically turned blue when I offered him that money. Him take a bribe, the Honorable Walter Van Haas. Are you kidding me? It could have been the whole 10000 and it wouldn't have been enough. It was a matter of principle. You dig? No, I don't. He didn't tell Brewster about my offer. He wouldn't rat on me. That was part of his code, too. But he did tell the old man about the phony charges. I couldn't stop him. That's when I got booted upstairs and you got booted out. And Mr. Walter Van Haas gets your job. He didn't even want to accept that. Can you believe it? Old man had to twist his arm to get him to accept it. And a 50-buck-a-week raise. What is this guy? Some, some kind of a fanatic? I don't know how to describe Walter. He's so square. He's so honest. I swear it's true. You couldn't budge this guy for a million bucks. A million bucks, a million bucks. The great American words. The incantation of the American dream. Charlie, hmm? did you ever hear of the Chinaman button? The which? When you were a kid. Didn't anybody ever ask you about it? It's, it's kind of a puzzle. I, I guess you could call it a moral dilemma. No, I never heard of it. What's a Chinaman button? It goes like this. Now, suppose you were told that by simply pressing a button, you could kill the Chinaman thousands of miles away. A Chinaman whose fate meant nothing to you, no more than the fate of a fly on a table. And yet, by pushing this button, by sending just one anonymous Oriental to his death, you would receive one million dollars. Tax-free. What would you do, Charlie? Uh, I don't know. Press the button, I guess. Sure, that's right. You'd press the button. I'd press the button. Even Walter Van Watts' face would press the button. No, not him. Not that guy. Oh, yeah, sure he would, Charlie. No, I, I really don't think so, Phil. Walter would think about it and begin wondering if that Chinaman might not have a wife and kids. Walter does. He's got five kids, as a matter of fact. You're wrong, Charlie. Everybody's the same when it comes to money. It's the great leveler. No, no, I really mean it. Walter wouldn't push that button for $10 million. That's the kind of guy he is. And that's 
Why, you don't have the Brewster account anymore. He pushed that button just like anybody else. Okay, okay. What's the difference? There isn't any Chinaman button. So, what's the difference? That's right. There isn't any Chinaman button. Or is there? I don't get you, Phil. What's all this talk about uh, a button? I didn't say there had to be a button, Lou. Not literally. Or a Chinaman, for that matter. Van Haas sounds, sounds Dutch. How about a Dutchman? What are you talking about? I think he drank a little too much at lunch. He wouldn't be so high and mighty once he pressed that button, would he? That would knock his halo off. What? Which is worse, Lou? Taking a kickback or killing a man? Oh, come on, Phil. Will you talk sense? Uh, we'd have him right where we want him. We could call the shots then, Lou. We can get Charlie his job back. We might even get our account back. Oh, for Pete's sake, Phil, will you tell me what you're talking about? Better. I'll show you what I mean. Only first, I gotta compose a letter. A letter to who? Don't rush me. This has gotta be done right. We're going to have to print up a special letterhead, something that really looks authentic. Somebody in the art department can do that. For what for? Yeah, let me use that portable of yours. Uh, I'll have to find one of those services that post letters from overseas. Dear Mr. Van Haas, you're writing this guy? Yep. Well, what are you going to say to him? I am going to offer him the American dream, Lou. <laughs> Uh, Millie? Oh, Walter, I, I didn't know you were home. Uh, I got here about ten minutes ago. I was looking through the mail. How are you? Oh, all right. Tired as usual. Isn't it, isn't it kind of chilly to be out here? Oh, I just had to get out of the house. Kids have been impossible all day. You know how hard it rained this morning. Yes, yes, I know. Honey, did you see the letter? Hmm? The one from South Africa? Oh, yeah, sure, I noticed it. Uh, say the stance, will you? Peter wants it. Yeah, Millie, Millie, uh, do you know what the letter's about? No, can't imagine. Oh, you, you don't know anyone in South Africa, do you? Of course not, but somebody there knows me. It's it's from some law firm. Look look at the letterhead. Uh-huh. Dries, Hertog, and Beer, Beer and Brook? <laughs> what a name. Uh, it's, it's Dutch, I guess. Mm-hmm. Dries, Hartog, and Berenbrook. Hmm. 200 Commissioner Street, Johannesburg, South Africa. Read it, huh? Well, it says, Dear Mr. Van Haas, our firm is collecting data for record-keeping purposes concerning the surviving family of one of our clients. Would you be so good as to confirm the following facts? Your name, Walter Van Haas. I can confirm that, all right. Well, go on. Read the rest. Your father's name, Benjamin Van Haas. Right again. Your mother's name, Sylvia Reach. I didn't know your mother's name was Sylvia. Uh, She always hated the name. That's why she called herself Sally. Anyway, now let's see. Paternal grandparents, Jan Van Haas, Elsa Voort. If the foregoing facts are not correct, would you kindly advise us by return mail? Well, I just saved some postage anyway. Is that all it says? No, just one more sentence. If these facts are correct, there is no need for further communication. Thank you for your attention to this matter. Yours faithfully, L. Something or other. I can't make out the signature. For heaven's sakes, Walter, what do you suppose it means? I've the faintest idea. Maybe I've got a rich uncle in South Africa. Maybe he owns one of those diamond or gold oh, mines. if only. Tell him to send us a couple of diamonds fast. <sighs> Maybe we could start looking for a new house. If I don't get out of this cheese box soon, I'll, I'll, I'll just go out of my mind. I'll settle for a couple of gold nuggets. We can melt them down and use them to fill Elsa's teeth. That ought to cut down that dental bill. Look, why don't you write to those people in South Africa and ask them what it's all about? Well, you heard what the man wrote. If these facts are correct, there is no need for further communication. Thank you for your attention to this matter. Faithfully yours. Scribble, scribble. How does that sound, Lou? Sounds like the real thing, Phil. <laughs> Look at that letterhead. Is that perfect or is that perfect? Harry Twinner in the art department did it. Use the transfer type you just rub on the paper. You can't tell it from the real thing. Well, where'd you get the names from? Van Haas's family? I got them from Charlie Edwards, right out of the files at the Brewster Company. You really got it mail from South Africa? Yeah, straight from Johannesburg. Airmail special delivery. Should have arrived by now. Phil, it's crazy. You going to all that trouble just for a joke on the guy? It's not a joke. 
It's serious business. Hand me that phone. Yeah. What are you doing now? Hello, Brewster Company? Mr. Van Haas, please. My name is... Thompson. Just tell Mr. Van Haas that I wish to speak to him in connection with South Africa. I'm sure he'll understand. Yeah. Yeah, I'll wait. So, will you please tell me what you're doing? I'm going to make an appointment with this man, Lou. I'm going to make a deal with him. For the Chinaman button. Bill Thurston seems to have invented his own Chinaman button. But will his improved model work? It all depends on Mr. Walter Van Haas. We'll return shortly with Act Two. Now, let's go back to Phil Thurston. Or rather, let's go back to Mr. Thompson, since that's the name Mr. Thurston used to make his reservation at the Ebb Tide Restaurant in downtown Manhattan. Nice of you to come all the way downtown to meet me for lunch, Mr. Van Haas. That's okay. I'm sorry I don't have a permanent office, so a place like this is convenient for me. You still haven't told me what business you're in, Mr. Tom. I would have come to your home for this meeting, but I didn't want to disturb your wife and children. Uh, you do have children, don't you? I sure do. Five of them. <laughs> How old are they? Step ladder. Two, four, six, eight, ten. That's a lot of mouths to feed. Yep, and teeth to fill. <laughs> I don't doubt it. Did you say that you were with that law firm in Johannesburg, Dries Hartog and... Sorry, I can't remember the last name. I'm not sure I could pronounce it if I did. Your family is Dutch, isn't it? Yeah, my grandparents were Hollanders, but the rest of us are strictly Yanks. Uh, well, the answer is no. I don't come from the attorneys in Johannesburg, but I wanted to talk to you about their letter. Now, frankly, we couldn't figure it out, Millie and I. That's my wife. I, I, I don't remember having any relatives in South Africa, and neither does my father. Oh, your dad's alive, then? Yes, he lives in Allentown. I called him, but he didn't have any answers. Uh, well, maybe I can help. You see, there is a relative, but a very distant one. One of those cousins four and five times removed. What's his name? Well, it wouldn't mean anything to you if I told you. Yeah, but you do know his name. It is my business to know such things. Well, that, uh, that brings us back to the original question, doesn't it? about what business you're in. The person who told me the name of your relative was a clerk in the offices of Dries, Hartog, and Birenbuk. He works for them, but you might say that he's on my payroll, too. I don't think I understand. He's the one who informed me about the letter that was being sent to you and uh, why it was being sent. Is there any reason why you can't tell me my cousin's name? I'd rather not. I think you'll understand why uh, later. But I will tell you something about him. Fine. He left the Netherlands with his family when he was when he was very young. He's lived in South Africa since. He's in the diamond business. Well, well. He's a widower, he has no children, and he's rich. He is very, very rich. And at the moment, he has only one traceable heir. Wait a minute. You mean that I actually do have a rich uncle in South Africa? I know, I said cousin. But that's incredible. I mean, Millie and I were kidding about it. We even said that he, he might be in the diamond business. Oh, he is. Very much so. A and are you saying that I'm his only heir? That's correct. Well, if there was the possibility of some kind of inheritance, why didn't the lawyer say so? Simple enough. There was nothing to say. What? The attorneys were only performing a routine function, putting the gentleman's will in good order. Undoubtedly, they'll have to redraw the will sooner or later in favor of a closer relation, such as a new wife. A wife? You see, this rich cousin of yours is only 41 and in excellent health. How old are you, Mr. Van Hus? 43. <laughs> so that's all there was to it, just a routine inquiry. At the moment, that's all there is to it. Well, I'm not surprised. I... I never did believe you get something for nothing in this world. I said at the moment. What do you mean? Mr. Van Haas, you don't know this man in South Africa. You don't know the first thing about him. In fact, he means nothing at all to you. I guess so. And the only way he could mean something to you is, is by dying. Isn't that right? 
Well, that's a rough way of putting it, but uh, if you mean that he won't benefit me until his death, I guess that's obvious. Now, what if I told you that this man will be dead in two or three days, and that his entire estate will be yours? I thought you said he was healthy. Well, I'm just asking how you would feel. Sorry for the guy, I suppose. Sorry about a man you don't know? Well, he's a human being. I see. Mr. Van Huss, did you read the newspaper this morning? Yes, I did. You looked at the obituary page? Ah, yeah, briefly. Did you feel sorry for all the people whose death was reported? Did you feel any real sorrow for them? No, I, I can't say I felt sorrow. Because they were all strangers, weren't they? All right, Mr. Thompson, I'm a human being, too, and I guess... If I got a letter from Dries, Hartog, and whatever telling me that I was rich, I wouldn't go into mourning. I'd probably go out and celebrate. <laughs> if you saw my kids' dental bills, you'd understand. <laughs> but I do understand. Believe me, I understand very well. That's why I wanted to see you, to suggest arranging that happy event without the slightest trouble on your part, without any obligation until you're completely satisfied. What the devil does that mean? All you have to do is say yes. Just that one word and your dream will come true. Yes to what? Now, in a short time, you'll receive another letter from Johannesburg informing you of the sad news that your cousin, Mr... Well, I still won't reveal his name. Let him remain anonymous. That'll make your decision a great deal easier, I'm sure. What decision? The decision to inherit his estate. Now, hold it just a minute. Are you talking about... Please, keep your voice down. Mr. Van Haas, I'm making this as easy for you as pushing a button. If you give your approval, my agents in Johannesburg will be contacted within hours. The rest will be handled simply and with dispatch. All you'll have to do is wait for official notification of your inheritance. When the money arrives, of course, I'll expect payment in the amount of ooh, 50% of the total. By our calculations, I'd say that total should be just about... Uh, one million U.S. dollars. Good Lord, I... Th I really think that... I think you mean it. I think you really do. I know you have scruples, Mr. Van Haas, but I also think you have common Listen, sense. Listen, Mr. Thompson, if that's your name... Yes, of course, you're quite right, it isn't. But it's the name you'll use to get in touch with me. I'm not getting in touch with you because I can give you your answer right now. It is no. Oh, don't be so hasty. I never heard such a filthy proposition in my entire life. Look, if the percentage is the problem, we can discuss it. Our organization has been known to be flexible about such Money things. has nothing to do with it. We could base our agreement on a sliding scale. That is, we would take 50% of any inherited amount up to and including $1 million. Anything after that, our percentage would be 40%. Does that sound more attractive? Do you talk about it like it was some kind of a simple business deal. But it is. Especially simple for you. A very clean, very uncomplicated deal. You do nothing at all, Mr. Van Haas. Can I make you understand that? You won't be connected to your cousin's death in any way. In fact, our agents are so expert at what they do, it's almost certainly going to be called an accident. Believe me, we've never had the slightest bit of trouble in the past. You heard my answer, Mr. Thompson. Now, if you'll excuse me. You haven't had your lunch yet. My appetite is gone. Van Haas. What? <laughs> I, I'm sorry. Perhaps I put the whole thing to you too bluntly. I shouldn't have expected a man like yourself to agree immediately. Or ever. All right, all right. Maybe you'll never agree. But at least give yourself some time to think it over. I don't need any time. Just 12 hours. 12 hours, that's all I'm talking about. Now, if you change your mind any time during the next 12 hours, you can reach me at the Florentine Hotel on 51st Street. Hey, did you get that name? I don't need to remember it, Mr. Thompson. I'd like to forget your name, too, in this whole conversation. I'll be at the Florentine Hotel between 8 o'clock and midnight tonight. Uh, don't call me after 12, my sleeping habits, you understand? I don't see how you can sleep at all, Mr. Thompson. You'd be amazed at how well rich men sleep. Well, you can go to bed early tonight. Don't wait up for my call because there won't be one. Goodbye. So long, Walter. I'll be hearing from you. Honey, honey, shut up. 
What is out? Stop it. No, 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 no. Tell me, tell me what the matter is. Nothing. It's, 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 it's nothing. It, it's got to be something, Millie. I, are the kids okay? Yes, they're all right. It's pretty quiet in the playroom. Well, that's because I bagged the twins off to Mother. They were getting out of a hand, Walter. I just couldn't stand it anymore. Oh, okay, fine. I'm sure your mother is delighted. No, she isn't. Maybe she used to be when she was younger, but she's getting too old for that sort of thing now. Maybe I'm getting too old, too. Come on, what are you talking about? I'm 41 years old, Walter. Sometimes I feel like 141. You know what's wrong with you? You're not eating right. You're uh, eating like a bird these days. Well, that's practically all I can afford to buy these days. Bird food. I didn't mean that, Walter. Honest, I didn't. I know you didn't. I know it. Look, honey, I wish you'd see Dr. Julian and have him check you over. Well, that... I did see Dr. Julian. You did when? Mm hmm this morning. I didn't know you were going. Well, I I didn't want you to know. Not until I was sure, anyway. Sure about what? Hey, you're, you're not sick, are you? I mean, did he find anything serious? No, I'm not sick. I'm... I'm pregnant, Walter. What? You see, I'm not over the hill after all. I can still make babies. It should be some sort of comfort, shouldn't it? A baby... Dr. Julian shook his finger at me and said he was going to call you sometime and give you a lecture on the population explosion. Well, that's just great, honey. No, Walter, it's not just great. Oh, honey, don't pretend to be happy about it. I just can't... Well, it's not the end of the world. Oh, that's right. It's a beginning, isn't it? That's what Mother said when I told her. She's always said that, even with the first one, with Peter. Ten years ago, almost eleven. Well, did you realize we've been married almost thirteen years? I know, Melly, and I know they haven't always been easy years. Why is everything always beginning? When does the middle of everything start for us? Is our life just going to go from beginning to end without anything worthwhile in the middle? <laughs> Oh, no! What was that? I asked Elsa to wash the dishes and put them away. Oh, I'd better get in there before they're all broken. Millie, we have to talk. After dinner, all right? I haven't even started it yet. I'm sorry. It's all right. I, I've i got some work to do anyway. Or some thinking anyway. <laughs> Got something going for you, Phil? You might say that. Oh, you bachelors really have a good life. Where does she live? Pat around here? Actually, I took a hotel room for a couple of days. At the Florentine. She wouldn't have a friend, would she? Well, I could call Louise and tell her I have to work tonight. <laughs> now, forget it. She'll never buy that. My wife's got a built-in lie detector. Don't eat your heart out, Charlie. This is strictly a business proposition. Yeah, I know your business propositions, Phil. Monkey business. You're trying to get a new client for the agency, right? Something like that. How do you think it looks? Will you get the deal? Charlie, I'm almost dead sure of it. Will Walter Van Haas press the Chinaman button? Would you press it? To make a million dollars? Before you answer... Wait until we return with Act Three. Now let's pay a visit to the Florentine Hotel. It's a posh little hotel with all the conveniences. And in room 610, there's a gentleman registered under the name of Thompson. for the gang of the Williamsburg Warehouse. And now, here's the time of weather check. It's exactly 40 minutes past the hour. Also. Hi, Lou. Come on in. 
So, this is the Florentine Hotel, huh? Well, that's not a bad-looking room. Why, well, the corners are sweet. That's right. The bedroom is in there. Look at this bar set up. Glasses, refrigerator, and everything. It's nice. Very nice. You want a drink? <laughs> All I got is vodka. Oh, no, thanks. I'm strictly a scotch man. You know that. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's okay. I'm not staying long. I'll just uh, leave the layouts and the reports for you to look over. We can talk about them in the morning at the shop. Relax, Lou. Your wife knows you're working late tonight, doesn't she? Yeah, she knows. Well, sit down. Take it easy. Look, I got some orange juice. I can make you a screwdriver. No, thanks, Phil. <laughs> Guess I have to drink alone, then. Well, aren't you going to ask me about your friend, Van Haas? What about him? I told you I was going to see him today, or rather that Mr. Thompson was going to see him. Did you? That's right. I saw him for lunch and told him the whole story about how easy it was for him to become a millionaire just by pushing the Chinaman button. Or <laughs> maybe I should have called it the Dutchman button. Did he believe it, Phil? All the way. But did he go for it? I mean, about having a guy in South Africa killed. Uh, no. No, he wouldn't go along. Ah, uh, so Charlie was right. He said no because he was scared. He was afraid that he was getting into something too deep for him. Well, maybe that wasn't it, Phil. Maybe he is the kind of guy Charlie says he is. Maybe he was that kind of guy, Lou. And that was before he ever got really tempted. A lot of people are honest because they never had anything worth being dishonest about. Am I right? You don't think much of people, do you? I think people are people, that's all. Open your eyes, Lou. Look at what's happening all around you. Everybody's on the grab. You don't know that by now. You've been living in a cave all your life. All right, all right. I don't want to argue with you. Everybody's corruptible, Lou. Everybody. High and low. Yeah, it sure looks like it these days. These days, old days, any days. We're just hearing more about it now. That's the only difference. But there are limits, Phil. I mean, like what you offered Van Haas. Well, let's face it, you were talking about murder. Maybe that's the word that came to his mind, too. But when he thinks it over, he'll give it a different name. He'll come to the conclusion that all I was talking about was pushing a button. You mean you still think he'll say yes? I told him to call me here. That's why I took this suite at the hotel under the name of Thompson. So that's what it was. And I figured, I don't know, that you had some chick you didn't want to know your right name. I told Van Haas to call me here any time before midnight, in case he changed his mind. Before midnight? It's almost 11 o'clock now. That's right. Well, why did you give him a deadline? Because he needs one. We all need one, or we postpone things forever. Phil, I don't think he'll call. Why not? I think the guy's already made up his mind. Oh, no, he hasn't. He's watching the clock right now, just as we are. He's watching those hands move towards 12, thinking about how simple it would be to pick up the phone and call. <laughs> you see, that's the beauty part of the whole thing. The simplicity. You remember that old camera slogan, you press the button, we do the rest? No, I don't think you're right. I don't think he'll do it. I can see him right this minute, Lou. Maybe he's in bed, looking up at the ceiling. Maybe he's locked himself up in the study, and he's telling himself all the reasons why he shouldn't say yes. Then he wonders if he's really fair to make the decision all by himself. I mean, I mean, there's his wife, too. He remembers all the little deprivations, all the promises he made to her when they were younger, those trips to Europe, the mink coat. Then there are the kids, of course. Five kids, Lou. Think what that money would mean to them. <laughs> He's really moved by the thought of the kids. You know, uh, maybe I'll have a drink after all. He's not thinking of himself, of course. No, he doesn't count. The things he would like to do, the places he wants to see, or, or that car he wants to own. You ever know a man who didn't want some car he couldn't afford? Yeah. And then there's that nice, smug feeling of security he could have with that pile of money swelling with interest in some bank that never thought he was worth more than a calendar at Christmas. Well, maybe he is thinking all that, Phil, but just the same, I don't think he'll call. Goodbye, sleep, honey. 
You know, I'm less than two months gone, honey. I, if, if you're really upset well, about... Stop that kind of talk. Well, I just thought... Well, there are alternatives. I'm sick of hearing about that alternative. I heard about it the last time you were pregnant, remember? I'm sorry. I, I know you're worried about money. I know all the debts we had. We'll and... get along. Honey, you're not angry with me? No, I'm not angry. I'm just restless. I've got business worries. Can't turn my mind off. Why don't you read a while? The light will keep you awake. Uh, I'll go to the living room. Walter? Yep. I love you. I love you too, Millie. Listen to that clock. Why do cheap clocks have to tick so loud? Yeah, we've got to get ourselves an electric one. Maybe one of those digital clocks. Darling, they cost money. Yes. What doesn't? Hello? Oh, yeah, yeah, I ordered the scotch. Oh, you can, huh? All right, thanks. Sorry, Lou. Room service can't deliver from the bar after 11.30. That's okay, Phil. I don't really want to drink anyway. <laughs> I'm almost out of liquor myself. You're almost out of time, too. Quarter to 12. See, I just can't believe it. I can't believe that guy could be that... that stupid. Is that what you call it? Of course. I mean, who wouldn't jump at a chance like this? Oh, I'm making it so... so easy for him. So painless. Easier than scratching along on a paycheck shot through with deductions. Easier than, than bowing and scraping every day of your life to people whose guts he hates. You know old man Brewster. Can you imagine having to be nice to that guy every day? We did it. Yes. That's why I know. Ah, oh, Phil. I think you're taking this joke much too much to heart. You're letting it mean too much to you. There's still time left for him to call. But he won't. And he's probably getting panicky right now. What about you, Phil? He sees the whole thing slipping away from him. He's telling himself how dumb he is. He's telling himself that the Chinaman doesn't mean a thing to Dutchman. him. Dutchman. He's telling himself that he's got a bigger duty, a, a greater responsibility to his wife, to his kids, even to himself. Well, to forget it, it's, it's over. no concern of his what happened 7,000 miles away. He doesn't have to dirty his hands. All he has to do is, is call. You're lost, Phil. Why don't you admit it? Aren't you going to answer it? Sure, sure. I'll answer it. Maybe room service again. Maybe. Hello? Mr. Thompson? This is Walter Von Haas. Okay, okay, I'm coming, I'm coming. Who is it? Room service. Ah, breakfast. Come on in, I'm starving. Yes, sir. Are you sure those scrambled eggs are hot? They tasted like rubber yesterday morning. They should be all right, sir. Yeah, well, you tell the chef he'll hear from me if they aren't. Yes, sir. Will you sign right here, sir? Okay. There we are. Thank you. I'll be back later for the table. Uh, half an hour, that's all I need. Yes, sir. Uh, I guess my shower's going to have to wait. Oh, now what? Hello. Bill, it's low. Oh, hi, what's up? How come you're still at the hotel? I thought you're just going to stay there one or two days. It's the third day now. I like it here. They stay until the end of the week. Besides, I saw some great-looking chicks at the bar downstairs. Well, what's happening? Nothing. I was just wondering if you knew anything about, uh... What do you know, Van Haas? <laughs> Walter Van Haas? He's just waiting for the mailman, Lou. Waiting to hear the good news from South Africa. <laughs> I spoke to Charlie Edwards. Van Haas called in sick yesterday. Yeah, I'll bet he was sick. I'll bet he was home planning on ways to spend all that money he thinks he's going to get. One million bucks. Uh, no, <laughs> 500 grand. Are you coming into the office soon, Phil? Sure, I'll be there just as soon as I finish breakfast and grab a shower. I'll see you later, then. All right. Yeah, I'll bet those eggs are cold for sure. Oh, for Pete's sake, it's a conspiracy. Hello, Mr. Thompson. Well, what are you doing here? May I come in? I told you not to get in touch with me, Van Haas. Yes, I know you did, but I... I had to talk to you in person. I told you that it was for your own protection. And I don't 
worry. I found out your room number, and I came up the back stairs. Nobody knows I'm here. Well, why are you here? Please let me come in. All right. As you can see, I'm just about to take a shower, so whatever you have to say, would you make it fast? Yes, I'll make it fast. Uh, I hope you haven't come here to say that you changed your mind, because it's too late for that. The thing is over and done with. It is? You're sure of that? Well, as soon as you gave me your okay, I was in touch with our agents in Johannesburg. They didn't waste any time either. And it it, it went, uh, all right? Flawlessly, just as I promised. Now, all you have to do is wait. Yes, I see. I, uh, I just had to hear it from you, Mr. Thompson. I, I had to hear it from myself. Well, now you've heard it. Now you go home and you wait for the mailman. Yes, the mailman. What's the matter, Van Hus? You look strange. You feel all right? Oh, yes, I feel fine. Truth is, I... I never felt better in my life. Good. Good. I'm glad to hear it. I feel a lot different than I felt two days ago. I can't tell you what a torture it was for me to make that phone call to you. Absolute torture. But after I hung up, I felt as light as a feather. You did, huh? Yeah. I felt fine. I felt wonderful. Even though I got myself involved in killing a man. It's funny, isn't it? It was easy, wasn't it? Just like I said it would be. Yes, that's the word. I never knew anything could be that easy. Changed me, Mr. Thompson. I saw how stupid I'd been all my life. How stupid most of us are to waste the one life we're given. I owe you a lot. Well, if you came to say thanks, you're welcome. Now, if you'll excuse me... I felt me, uh... like a giant. I felt I felt there was nothing I couldn't do. I, I was a coward before, a weakling. But you showed me a better way. Okay, okay. Uh, would you go home now, Mr. Van Haas? I mean, the less we see of each other, the better. Now, when the money arrives, I'll be in touch with you. About my 50%. Yes, your 50%. That's really what I wanted to discuss, Mr. Thompson. Tell me... Did this fireplace work, or is it just for show? I really wouldn't know. But I see that they have all the implements. <laughs> what are you doing with that poker? Van Haas, are you crazy? Aye, Mr. Thompson, but 100% is so much better. I thought I'd have to bring a hammer or something, but a poker was so much better. Now... <laughs> Into the bathroom, Mr. Thompson. Up, up, into the shower. Yeah. What a shame that you slipped in the tub, Mr. Thompson. What a terrible shame. Now I have to go home to wait for the mailman. <laughs> If you're going to dig a grave for a man, make sure you dig two. I'll return shortly. Ready for an instructive statement? It goes like this. The wonderful thing about radio is that it can be enjoyed in complete darkness. And isn't darkness the natural medium for mystery? Our cast included Paul Hecht, Ralph Bell, Mason Adams, Evie Juster, and Will Hare. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. You know the saying, if you can't lick them, join them? Come on. I decided to join you, Jason, to do business your way. I want a certified check for $50,000. When I finished, I want another fifty. And you know me well enough to realize that I'm not going to give you $50,000 just because you asked for it. Not even to save your life? Are you trying to blackmail me, Harry? I'm trying to do you a favor. Your life should be worth at least $100,000. Before I agree, answer one question. Do you know who's going to kill me? I do. Who? Me. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, 
pleasant dreams.